Thank you for being with us tonight. This meeting has been brought to you in part by... Let Grand Forks International Airport help you start your next vacation off on the right foot. Grand Forks International Airport offers flights to the sunny destinations of Orlando, Las Vegas, and Phoenix on Allegiant, and connections anywhere in the world through Minneapolis-St. Paul on Delta. Forget the hassle of long drives, parking nightmares, and stressful check-ins. The convenience of flying locally means less headaches and more time for you. Grand Forks International Airport. Your airport. Simply grand. Know what's in this box? Well, in case your crystal ball is broken, here's a hint. Safe, reliable energy, for starters, but there's also a commitment to this community. See, at Excel Energy, this is our hometown. So we're not just about making a living here, we're about living here. Oh, I wish I had wings. In our community, we're always delivering. Excel Energy, responsible by nature. Chris Young, live, Raised on Country Tour. I was raised on country. October 3rd, Alaris Center. Chris Young, hit after amazing hit. And tonight I'm drowning. With special guests, Eli Youngman and Matt Stell. Tickets on sale now at LiveNation.com or Ticketmaster.com. Chris Young, Raised on Country Tour. All right, let's get the show on the road. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to beautiful downtown Grand Forks, home of the University of North Dakota. This is Grand Forks City Council's Committee of the Whole for Monday, September 23rd. Under item one, call to order 1.1, welcome and roll call. Weigel? Here. Dockler? Here. Weber? Here. Monk? Here. Marshall? Here. Sandy? Here. Veen? Here. We have a quorum. Great. Under uh, item two, discussion items 2.1, application for class three on and off sale wine and beer alcohol beverage license by Northern Air Family Fund Center. Good evening, Mr. Swanson. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Uh, I sent a memo late this afternoon to the council, and I, I, the reason I'm here is I want to make sure there aren't any unintended consequences or confusion. The application appears to be in order. It is being reviewed by the various departments. My concern is whether or not the applicant, and I understand he's here, I haven't had a chance to talk to him, realizes that if the license is issued, the entire premise becomes a licensed premise. And under that, they cannot have minors on there. And I don't think that's consistent with their, their business activity or business plan. The only exception is if they meet the definition under the liquor code of a restaurant and they, as I understand it, they don't prepare and serve food and meals on site. Now one of the options around that is if they designated an area, and I tried to find out from inspections but I couldn't get the information, it may be that they're designating a specific area where the alcohol is served and consumed. In other words, it doesn't leave that area and minors aren't allowed in there. That would be permissible. But if the plan is to serve the alcohol in one area and you could take it throughout the premise, that's not allowed <coughs> under our code. Because It would be if they're a restaurant, but they don't meet that definition. Otherwise, the application appears to be in order for a wine and beer license. Um, and I, the only reason to bring it up is I I don't want it to be a surprise for somebody down the road when they thought they had one understanding and something else came forward. In talking to finance and talking to the health department, I don't think that part of the code explanation has ever been provided to the applicant. And I can certainly answer any questions. Any else may have questions for Mr. Have. Swanson? Mr. Weber? I, I suspect that I might have more questions, but could we hear from the owners first about the, their intentions and what their thoughts are about what they just, I'm guessing what they've maybe just heard for the first time. Yeah. Or, yeah. Can you, <clears throat> your name and address for the record, please? Hello, my name is Brian Lee. My address is 3433 Ivy Drive, and I'm one of the owners for Northern Air Family Fun Center. Um, so we are actually, if, if you look at the whole plan, there is going to be a kitchen area that is going to be happening within probably a couple of months. So. To answer your question, we will be preparing food 
it'll be in a little different area than where we're planning on doing the alcohol sales. The alcohol sales would be limited right now to where the our other attraction is going, and that's gonna be the ax throwing area. How, how most of the other places do it that also serve alcohol and have that attraction is they have anybody from 13 and up. And there's a bunch of them around. We're gonna be part of the World Ax Throwing League. If you go on their website, you see all kinds of them that have that attraction along with alcohol. And most of them do from 13 year old up, as long as they're with a parent. Obviously, you know, you have to be 21 in order to, to consume alcohol, but that's how they, that's how they do it. Yes, Mr. Weber. And, and so is it your intention that the alcohol would be limited to that restaurant area? Well, I, I would hope <clears throat> that parents would be able to take it throughout the facility. Okay. In a similar fashion to, um, say can add in where where they sell it right in the arcade in the water park area and you're able to take it out into the water park area similar to how uh, the bowling alley does it where it's purchased in one area but you're able to still take it around the whole facility that 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 I guess is my hope so with with the food thing that's that that is becoming an issue when we start to prepare our own food then that, if I understand what you're saying, that satisfies that then. Yeah, depending upon the menu, I, I yep. don't know anything about your food preparation, yep. but that means <clears throat> And basically what we're talking about doing is we're talking about doing pizzas, um, not, not a very, we're doing a real limited, easy concession kind of thing. Okay, but we will be making our own pizzas and that kind of thing. So if we use the, the bowling alley analogy, Mr. Swanson, how does that it's a different not license, fit? Different class of license. Uh, same with can uh, If you look at the wine and beer license, the exceptions for minors on the premises are for restaurants, uh, a couple of other things. And, and he may fall into it if he has the food. I, this is the first I've heard that they're planning on preparing food. Uh, but uh, I was hoping he was going to tell us that there was going to be a designated area where the alcohol was going to be served, consumed, and stayed there, because then we can solve all the issues. Uh, as far as the can add, that's a hotel motel license. It's a different type. They have other requirements they have to meet. The bowling alley, again, they have an entirely different set of circumstances. This is a general class three license. And you've schooled us well. We, uh, I, I'm not interested in creating a new kind of license. We, we've got enough different kinds of licenses now. How would, what would the cost difference be between what they're currently hoping to do and what you're suggesting in terms of the license? Is there a significant difference in the There'd price? There'd be no difference. <coughs> what, I, what I understood or what I was hoping he was going to say, I, I don't have much facts. I got the application on Thursday. And so I did shoot off some emails to the departments asking, you know what's happening in particular as interested in the inspections as to what what the operational plan was as far as the layout uh, so that's all news to me but accepting the fact that they were looking for a class three wine and beer license which allows both on sale and off sale i was hoping they were going to say they were going to have a designated area okay I was, oh, oh. So, slow down for just a second did you say off sale as well you have the authority to sell off sale. Okay, that, okay, that is not at all our intention. Well, I, okay. whether it is or isn't, okay. the, the license okay. allows on sale, on and off sale, a combination. So, okay. uh, again, without understanding, I went to their web page and all I saw, quite frankly, were kids' birthday parties and things of that nature for the most part. The, uh, I am aware that in some states, the ax throwing is being allowed on licensed premises. I'm not aware of any state, I, I, may, I just may not have enough information, but I'm not aware of any state that allows a combination of axe throwing alcohol and minors. Um, I guess that would be a policy decision for the council, but if, if we're going down that path, it would have to be a class three license, but then we get into even more, I think, delicate question as to presence of minors. He's technically an amusement center, is how we classify it. And which is allowed to have a class three license. So I, I don't know how you'd like to proceed. And 
and uh, we need to know more about the food operation. If he does have the class three license, it affects who can serve the alcohol as far as adults and things of that nature. But that's governed by state law, primarily. Mr. Swanson, what specific license does the bowling alley have? Is there a specific bowling alley license? Yes, there is. There is. There's a specific class, and that's historically, I think, been there back to the 60s. Okay. And n not to preach too much, but one of the concerns is that every time you create a specialized license, you run into these types of issues. But the bowling alley license goes way back, and um, there are certain requirements that the bowling alley has to meet. Uh, to to allow that have you considered adding a bowling lane kind of <laughs> cross my mind for a second one of my concerns is uh and and again it's all apples and oranges here but um with the downtown events we used to have a beer garden and we saw problematic behaviors and i think that we've seen that largely dissipated and and we we I, I've not seen drinking problems at uh, downtown events where we've had commingling and so when I first heard the idea that oh commingling um, has seemed seems to be working and and then when I got your memo this afternoon I thought oh this feels a little bit like the beer garden type uh, segregation that that hasn't been working so much but you're talking about commingling within uh, a limited space like a, like a restaurant would be able to do where, where minors are allowed in a restaurant I'm not talking about co-mingling at all I think the council is very aware of my feelings on that but what I'm saying is trying to find an avenue for this to go forward what I identified was the ability to identify a specific location as the licensed premise a licensed premise by definition cannot have minors on it. Our fallback, our default is the entire lot. Unless you designate something less, it's the entire lot that is a licensed premise. So when I looked to the web page and saw the activities are going on, uh, that was a concern. So I contacted inspections to find out, do they have a designated bar area, if you will? Um, for example, in our class four food and beverage license, those locations are supposed to have and do have a designated bar only area. And they're usually built off, roped off, half walled off, some separation between the general restaurant area and the bar area. In this case with a class three, that's what I thought we were doing. But I, from what I'm gathering now is the hope here was that the, the wine and beer once it was poured and sold would go throughout the premises and that'd be fine but we have the minor situation to get around that you have to amend the code um, not interested in, in that at, at this point um could when i first uh saw that northern air was applying for a liquor license um i, I must admit my my initial reaction was why do we need to have adults consuming alcohol at kids' birthday parties? Because my main experience with your facility has been going to my grandkids' birthday parties. But I think that you're maybe trying to do something else with your business model. Can, and and the, the written documents don't always capture some of those nuances. Can, can you help us understand what it is that you're... Is it going to be the kids' birthday parties with bouncy balloon houses and axes uh, right next like in the same space help me yeah. to understand what this looks like okay and the intention. so <clears throat> so we're you guys obviously know the building okay it's a huge building we've been systematically going through the building remodeling different areas of the building okay the area that we're talking about where the axe throwing and where the alcohol sales would take place is upstairs where the offices used to be Okay, we've also put in another wall that has a door that so that particular area can be open even when the whole rest of the facility is not open. Okay, so that we can and and you can talk to building inspections. We're putting in two new bathrooms upstairs so that we can have just that area open. And yes, we are. We're trying to expand because right now we're known as you know, a great place for kids to come and 
you know, relieve some stress and bounce around, but we're really missing the 20 plus. Okay, so we've been looking for something that we can add in the given space that we have that will be something new and something that is, is up and coming as an attraction that will help enhance what we have. And we'll have something else for, the, for that older crowd to come and experience on their own. Or while the kids are downstairs playing, they can be up throwing some axes if they want to, okay? Or they can sit and have a beer and watch the game if they want to. That's what we're trying to do. We're not trying to be a bar. We're trying to make this purely a convenience thing so that people can have a couple of drinks while they're having some fun doing that. And that's, that's what we're trying to provide. And I've, I've never been to an ax throwing establishment and it sounds kind of alarming at first, but I understand that these are growing in popularity across the country, uh, fairly common, sound like a lot of fun to people who I, I know who have been to these. Um, what are the safety issues around people throwing axes with, in, in, indoors? There's, there's a specific area where each, there's only one person with one ax in front of each target. Okay. And, and there's, we have the way we're going to have our setup, we're going to have three areas that are single targets that, that they can throw and go get their one ax and come back and either they throw it again or they switch with their partner or whoever. And then we're going to have three lanes that are doubles. Okay. So how the doubles work is that you would have a person in each lane with one ax, they throw it just like darts. Okay. When both have thrown, they go up to it, they take them out. They come back, nobody else is allowed up to that area until either they hand the ax off to the next person or, and then there's, there's lines that they can't cross when somebody is up there then with axes. So it's a very controlled, um, it, you, the first thought, I, I get it. The first thought is, ooh, axes and alcohol, okay. But I've already talked to my insurance company about this and you guys are gonna chuckle on this. It will be by far the lowest liability in my whole area, in my whole business. Okay, and it's because it's a controlled environment. They're 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 not. Um, it's not out of hand at all. It's not you know like they're throwing axes all around the building and okay. It's a it's a caged area. Okay, I have some photos that I you know if we could put up, but and, and I can show you. Matter of fact, I'd, I'd walk any of you guys through our facility and show you exactly what we're talking about doing. Okay, there's a fenced off area between each of the targets on the three singles and the three doubles. So if they don't stick, if they bounce around, whatever, okay, they're gonna stay in that area. And um, you're, you're also helping me to understand, uh, well, during certain hours, there would be, your intention is to have open flow throughout the building um, it's also possible to close this off, and this might have later hours than the uh, the bouncy castle type areas of the building. Yes, is that correct? As well? <clears throat> right now, right now our bounce houses shut down at eight o'clock on both Friday and Saturday night, and then they follow our normal hours on Sunday. So when we when we have what we call jump and jam, which is for middle school, high school to come in for the special from eight to ten. Our bounce house area is shut down, closed off. So the only access that they have is to the trampolines, to the laser tag, to our virtual reality system, and, and the ice cream and that kind of area. Even though many of us haven't heard of, of this before, um, I don't want to be in the situation where we have people driving by the interstate to, um, to go take part in this kind of growing popular, uh, this activity that's growing in popularity. Um, uh, if there are people who want to do that here in our community, I hope that we would find some way to do that. However, it sounds like there's some work that needs to be done in terms of aligning uh, your vision, your intention, and the liquor license categories that, that we currently have. If I just follow up. Uh, under current code, the, the axe throwing activity is not prohibited. The issue is minors within the area where alcohol is served. So 
you know, I, I, the axe thing sounds a little bit exotic, but I am aware and have read the articles from different city attorneys on dealing with that. And that's why I'm able to tell you I'm not aware that there are licensed premises that allow the sale of alcohol at the same time minors are throwing axes. I am aware of leagues and other activities where minors are involved in that, not unlike darts. So I'm not trying to prohibit the axe throwing or anything. The concern here is under your current code draft, without a designated area as a licensed premise, his entire facility becomes a licensed premise. Any other questions, Ms. Marshall? Uh, just a point of clarification. When you were talking about 13-year-olds uh, and you know persons under age 21 uh, being allowed to be involved in, in the axe throwing events, would they, in your mind, in, in your proposal, be in the same uh, seclusion uh, or secluded area, the same separate room for axe throwing where you'd be serving alcohol and and food, would that all be in one one area in this upstairs area with 13 year olds and or 13 to 21 year olds as well? The 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 axe throwing. <clears throat> it, it's my hope that the axe throwing with 13 and up would also be allowed in that same area where they're serving alcohol. Well, I have uh, a lot of difficulty with this this proposal, and, and uh, you know we've had a lot of discussions on the council about uh, where alcohol is allowed and where it's not allowed, and a lot of discussions about co-mingling and uh, what's uh, good and healthy for our community and what's not. Uh, even with the axe throwing, which I didn't know about it, uh, it just you know while I, I think we're generally really friendly towards businesses and we want to. Uh, help businesses to do novel kinds of things. Uh, this seems to real, really cross a bright line for me in terms of uh, going from, you know, a, a facility that's primarily for uh, children and, and children's parties and children's activities. Uh, you know, I, I just don't know why it has to involve alcohol. And I have these visions of people dropping their kids off at a party downstairs, going upstairs, having a couple of drinks. Uh, and then going and picking up the kids and driving a car full of kids home, uh, uh, probably over the alcohol limit. Uh, so I, I'm just really concerned about this whole whole idea. Doesn't make sense to me. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. Yes, Ms. Ma. So I haven't been there, but based on what you described, is it the bouncy area that's kind of the ground floor? And then what you're talking about is a new area above yes. is that correct like a second yes. floor okay so then because i've i've gotten some people who are concerned about this but the way you're describing it it would potentially be possible to limit the alcohol sales and use to that second story area so it's almost a separate entity is that what I'm gathering, yeah. <clears throat> that could be an option. Okay. It, that's an option, yes. So then with, um, I've seen, you know, some of the images and with the ax throwing, it seems almost like darts in a bar is kind of the way it yep. appears when you set that all up. So conceivably, there could be separation between the bounce area where it's kid focused and then this new concept and then the question there would perhaps become the percentage of food sales if it meets that restaurant criteria, how to set that up. Could you potentially have a separate area where the actual activities take place with the axe throwing and then another area where the food and alcohol sales, so there's some separation if you had leagues with underage minors? I'm not sure how that, <coughs> you, I'm, Part of the struggle here is probably that we don't have a site plan, so I'm trying to set it up in my mind for how that would look. Okay, um, <clears throat> and and I apologize that you don't have a site plan. I guess I understood that that uh, inspections was going to provide that. So um, it is an upstairs area. Okay, so the 
there's virtually no way to get to the inflatable area, bouncy houses, as you guys refer to them, okay? Because you're overlooking the second level through windows that, are, that go down, okay? So it's a completely separate area. The, whoop, I'm sorry. The trampolines, I talk with my hands, so. The, the trampolines are back off into our other section of our building on the lower floor. Same with our arcade and our virtual reality attraction. The ice cream sales that we do right now are, on the, are all on the first floor. So our laser tag arena and the axe throwing attractions then would be the only ones upstairs, okay? How, how, we're, how we're proposing this is that the sales only stay in, in that axe throwing area. We're, we're going to put in a kitchen area not a full-blown kitchen, but a, a kitchen area where where we do our own pizzas and, and that kind of stuff then for, for the people that come in. That's going to be downstairs kind of in our main lobby area. Okay. It would, it would greatly help if you guys had a site plan so you could see. Okay. Um, but that's, that's what we're, that's what we're proposing to do. And, and I guess, um, I see all kinds of separate businesses that are already doing this, okay? The bowling alley is one, the curling rink is another one, okay? And, and they all seem to fit under some other different category that is unattainable to me. Unless, you know, we apparently we shouldn't have tore down the Happy Host Inn, you know, when we'd had a motel and then we could have... You know, it's it's frustrating for me because I'm trying to do something that is going to have more of an impact for the people of the area. Not only just the kids, but adults as well. And we're not done with our remodeling. We're planning on other other attractions as well that are going to be bringing in not only kids, but also adults. And so that's where I would ask you guys to look at the bigger picture on this. And it's not a bar situation or a beer garden where we want people to just stay in. Okay, it's purely a convenience thing. Okay, I've had all kinds of dads come up to me and say, man, I just, I, I wish you had, alcohol sales. I'd have a beer while I'm sitting here watching my kids. Okay. And it's, that's what it is. It's, it's a convenience thing. And that's, that's what I, that's what I would hope. And similar to the curling rank where it's a, you know, minors can curl with, with adults. Okay. And the adults can be drinking while anywhere in the premises. Okay. And the minors aren't. So I, I, I look around and I see all kinds of different ways that it's being done. It's just that we're known as a kid place. And so that, I guess that's where, you know, maybe there needs to be more discussion and, <clears throat> and different options and figure out how we can make this work. Mr. Veen, do you have a comment? Yeah, just a comment. Mr. Swanson, from what I've heard so far, the proposal as presented does not work with any of our current city alcohol licenses. It doesn't meet the criteria for any of them for what he's proposing. And that we'd either have to create a new license or he has to rethink how his layout would be so that it could be workable with a current license. I think that would be an accurate summary. <clears throat> um, you'd have to create some special type of license that would allow minors uh, on the premises where alcohol. Uh, the, the comment about the curling club, I'm not aware of that. The curling club has a designated area that is supposed to be for their alcohol. Uh, if, if something else is happening, I'm just not aware of that. But uh, the, the issues of, of minors in licensed premises is very historically rooted. Um, and that's where the, the restaurant exceptions and a few of these came in. I, I guess I apologize, Mr. Lee and this council, if I've thrown a monkey wrench into this. 
I, because of the lack of information, I had to only assume that they were going to have a designated area. I figured everyone understood the relationship between alcohol and, and minors, even unattended minors, that may be there. So we can look at creating a new classification of a license uh, of some form. I can do some research on that. We can look at designating an area uh, where the alcohol you know, essentially stays. Uh, I'll look the direction from the council. But as it is right now, under our current code, <coughs> there's, a, there's a significant issue with respect to minors on the premises. Yeah, and so that's what the current request would make the whole building class three, which would impact underage. Correct. So that, that doesn't work, and I'm sure that's not his intent. And, so. and I recognize that right away. That's why I was hoping we were talking about a designated area. <coughs> Yeah, so that's why I said the, the alternatives really are one of those two. We either try to figure out how to amend or change or create a license, which would allow him to do exactly as he's talked about, or have him come back and relook at his facility and how it's laid out and whatever and see if there's an alternative. Mr. Weigel? I'm not completely opposed to this idea. Um, I brought my son many of times to to Northern Air. The, I just picture people consuming alcohol as the train goes around and around in a circle, and, I, and I'm not a fan of that. Um, but what I could see is kind of what we talked about before, where there is a, a specific area um, where this axe throwing is taking place, where somebody could buy a beer and, and 14 of above. Um, with food and whatnot. I can understand that. I'm not a fan of all over the premises. That's just my personal opinion. Um, but if there's a compromise to be had, maybe that's something where it's in one specific area of the building. So I'm, I'm on the fence either way, but I think there's something that we could be working on. I, uh, I, I, I guess I would kind of have to second uh, uh, Mr. Weigel's comments. I, uh, I'm curious, Mr. Lee, uh, will will your axe throwing concept go forward if you're not granted an alcohol license? Yes. You you are going to move forward anyway. <clears throat> and and I know you've said several times that you're not a bar, you're an alternative, you're this and that. But when you describe it, you've got separate entrances, separate uh, restrooms. You've got an area for throwing axes. You. So you can come in and have a beer, or you can sit and watch a game. You might not calling it a bar, but it sure sounds like a bar to me. It sounds like every sports bar in town, um, where you either go and throw darts or you go and sit and watch a game. So um, I, I think um, Mr. Weigel's concept of allowing alcohol to flow freely throughout the entire building, especially when the rest of the main floor of the building is designed for young people to be there. And so I can recognize that perhaps me as a parent might have seven-year-olds that want to go and jump, and I might want to have a beer and hang out with them. I think I could probably get by one night for a half an hour, 20-minute stretch, not having a beer while my kids are out bouncing around with all the other eight- and ten-year-old kids. Now, if I'm upstairs throwing axes and having beers with the buddies, that's, that's different. But to me, having that separated probably makes sense. Um, I, I don't know if I'm, I don't know where we go from here. Yes, Ms. Mock. I was just going to ask Mr. Lee, what, what's your timeline? Just so you understand, this is a community of the whole, and then we have five Mondays, and so this would go to a city council um, two weeks from today. Um, and so it's kind of in there in their, of where they want to move it forward, and it gives us two weeks to take a look at it, We're not knowing what's your time, what's your time frame on <coughs> making a decision. Otherwise, if we delay it, that means you're two weeks plus another two weeks out yeah. before a final resolution. Um, we, we're, tr we're shooting to be open somewhere between the middle of October to the end of October. I mean, with the, with the ax throwing part, if the alcohol part has to wait on that, you know, until we can figure something out suitably, then that's, that's what we need to do. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not opposed to limiting that area upstairs to, to, to just that. Um, the, problem, the problem with limiting that 
is that then I'm going to have to be forced to go to 21 and older into that area instead of having instead of allowing 13 and up to be able to throw axes in that area. So if if there's a way around that, then I'm all for that. <clears throat> there is our current code allows an alcohol free uh, period that can be designated for events or activities, but it, it has no alcohol during that time period. Uh, but that's already in your code. Ms. Mock, did you have a comment? Well, I just, um, I think it's fair to tell you that we've had several issues come up and as a city, a lot of people have been working to address addiction issues and that extends to alcohol. So there's a larger conversation where a lot of people are concerned about those larger issues. And I think where you're coming from is a new business opportunity. And some of the phone calls that I started getting were people that were concerned about alcohol in the presence of minors and in that environment. But really what you're talking about is kind of a new business opportunity and where we, we have businesses and alcohol is a part of them. And so I think the way you're describing it is actually a separate area where we can come to a compromise where kids can have their area, adults could have their area, and you can accomplish what you're going after. I just, I think it's fair to tell you that that's a larger issue and a larger conversation that's been going on for years. And that's where some of the hesitation comes from. Um, and those folks, they were very concerned. They saw Northern Air and then associated with alcohol. And that's where a lot of the concern was coming from. So I think it's, it's just fair to let you know that. And that's a lot of the concern that's coming in. I think, I think Mr. Swanson could probably work with you and work out some of those options and then we could review those options and make a decision from there. Thank you, Ms. Muck. Mr. Weigel? Uh, Mr. Phelan, if we move this forward pending Mr. Swanson and Mr. Lee coming back with a plan of attack before council, do you think that'd be appropriate? I think it would be bring a good um, we have a motion that would move this to council, which I think is uh, Monday, is it, I don't know, the 6th or 7th, I think it would come back. I don't have it in front of me, but I think it'd be good to move it forward. If it's not ready on that Monday, um, you can always um, delay it another two weeks, but at least we have an opportunity um, two weeks from today mm -hmm. uh, to have the compromise in front of you and to see if it's, it's good to move forward. So I, I would suggest you make a motion of some sort and see if something can move forward as part of a final um, opportunity for you to say um, yes or no to it. I'll make that motion just that we move it forward to council and pending Mr. Swanson. And well, I, I want to make sure I know what you're moving. If, if you're moving approval of the application and everyone needs to understand under the current code, the entire premises is a licensed premise. If you're moving forward, authorizing them to designate an area where it's alcohol to be served and consumed as adults only, we can work with that under our current ordinance. If you're looking to change the code, that won't be accomplished in the timeline that Mr. Phelan identified because it requires two readings of the code amendment, which would not get to until the last meeting in October for the code amendment. So just so uh, I think your options are to move it forward as an application for the entire premises, move it forward as an application for a designated premises to be identified by the applicant, uh, well, the other option, I guess, would be moving forward with some type of code amendment. I don't know exactly what that would be. Before I make my motion, I do have one question. So could he, could Mr. Lee essentially apply for a, a, um, a one-year, uh, put in where they, minors and people of, tw of age could drink together. What do we call that again? The word escapes me. Co-mingle. Could he make a one-year application to co-mingle in that area no provision in our code for that okay I mean, our, our code is, is actually to the opposite it prohibits the presence of the minors there okay i'll make a motion just to move it forward as is knowing that um, my intent would be that there's going to be a plan coming forward and then we can we can work from there Ms. dockler is there a second first of all 
Mr. Weber seconds. Great. Ms. Dockler? Um, so I guess one of my questions too is if there's commingling, let's say you can get a beer and sit down at the bouncy houses and watch the kids jump at a birthday party, is there anything that's been discussed about how that's going to change um, the contracts of birthday parties? Because what happens if a parent um, who's supposed to be supervising the birthday party becomes inebriated? and can't and is clearly not able to supervise anymore are parents going to be called to come and pick up their children uh, i guess i have questions about how that would go into effect because <coughs> definitely there's bar training we've heard that uh, for bartenders on cutting people off but you cut somebody off because they're at their limit they're already drunk so i guess that would be my question yes <clears throat> and and we've had in internal discussions on on that, on how to prevent. Training, we've heard that. Um, for I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> on on how to to make sure that that people are 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 drinking responsibly. Um, so there, in those discussions that you've been having to enforce people or enforce drinking responsibly, is there is that quantitative? I mean, are you saying that if a parent is there supervising a birthday party, you can have max two drinks? Or you can have max one drink? Or is it, we'll use our judgment as you go along like a bartender does, and they'll be cut off at some point? Because again, that cutoff point is generally because somebody's already had too many. <clears throat> it, uh, with the different shapes and sizes of people it's it's very difficult to put a, a number limit on for example my wife versus myself is is very difficult to put a number limit on and and still be um, legally able to say drive a car or that kind of thing so <clears throat> um, our internal discussions have been about making sure that that we're not creating a problem for ourselves. That's the last thing that we want to do. And um, we have a reputation of being a lot more conservative than most of the other trampoline parks in the nation. And <clears throat> that's how we would approach this same thing. It sounds a bit awkward, <coughs> axes and alcohol. Okay, but there's there's a lot of them doing this around the country. I'm actually not against the idea of axes and alcohol. Um, however, I am concerned about commingling when it is with minors. That's where my uh, issues come into play. Because what if there is if 13 year olds are allowed to go up there? Are they going to have to have a parent present with them, or are they able to just? go up if there's alcohol that's flowing in the axe throwing area um, on their own? <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, it, they would have to have a parent right there. That's, that's a no questions asked. When, when they do the waivers for, um, just like I, when I did, I took my family. Okay, I had a 14 year old, an 18 year old, a 24 year old and my wife. Okay, and we went and all of us did it together as a family deal. Okay, <clears throat> and we had to we had to sign a waiver that said we were going to be right there with them at all times. I mean, other than going to the bathroom. Okay, but we were going to be right there and making sure that that things were under control. And so we would adopt those same standards where parents have to be right there with them. They have to actually be doing the activity with them, not just sitting watching the game and doing something and letting them do whatever that's not that's not at all our intention if you can provide me with any information about locations where minors are allowed on a licensed premise where alcohol is served for these events it'd be very helpful for me to review okay. uh, my limited knowledge as to city codes that's an inconsistent provision where the minors are allowed are on premises that do not prohibit minors but where minors are prohibited, I'm not aware of anyone who's created the exception to go into a prohibited area for purposes of axe throwing. Now, again, to make sure everyone's very clear, the, the conduct of the axe throwing is not the point here. 
and that's not one that we regulate or control. So they can move forward with that at any time they want. The issue here is minors in a licensed premise. Mr. Weber. Mr. Swanson, is it possible to take the, the current bowling alley license and, and expand that? Because in, in many ways, this feels like there's some parallels. If that's the way the council wants to go, that's a policy decision for you. That would be the third option of altering the... That'd be the option of amending the city code right. to create a new right. new license. I'm, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the concerns we have in our community about alcoholism and binge drinking. Uh, these are, are serious problems for our community and the region. Uh, I'm also, at the same time, troubled uh, by this suggestion that um, somehow people who are going to do this are going to drink to excess. Um, if, if there's a birthday party at the bowling alley, um, if I have a concern about the parent that is going to be hosting the party, well, I, as a as a parent or a grandparent, I need to be considering that individual. Not that somehow bowling alleys lead to excess drinking or that um, if there's a birthday party at Olive Garden, my, they serve alcohol there. People are going to drink to excess. Um, and uh, so I, I, I'm worried that we, we jump to that. Uh, I think that if a parent is likely to be drinking to excess, they're maybe going to do that whether they're at home or maybe they're even less likely to do this out in a public activity like this. And if, if that child is only living that experience at home, I'm hoping that they can get out in, into the community because uh, like a bowling alley, this sounds like a, a fantastic community opportunity, a year round community opportunity. So uh, I look forward to seeing what might be worked out and maybe we can have this discussion again in a, in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Um, <coughs> my last thoughts i personally don't like the idea of pushing this forward as it currently sits i don't have a problem if you all vote to, to do that in my opinion this is mixing alcohol with minors and it and nothing personal to mr lee it feels like this hasn't been very well thought out and because of that i don't know where we're gonna go in two weeks from now and so um and i think miss dockler said it said it best um the uh the as it sits today the plan we could have people that maybe end up by a bouncy house you you might end up and although i like your concept mr weber of we we aren't worrying about people in the bowling alley i think in general terms bowling is is an adult sport that kids will occasionally go to jumping on trampolines is a kid's sport where adults are required to attend to watch their kids so to me, that's the differentiation between the bowling alley and um, and the jump and jam setting. So um, I, I won't be supporting that because I feel like they should spend a couple of weeks thinking about a better plan and, and bring it back myself. Yes, Mr. V. Yeah, if I could, I concur 100% with what you're saying. I think it's too fast to go through at this time. We can come back, look at potentially the ordinance change and or the, the the design changed and then we can have something to react to but to prove something that we're not going to go through with with the idea that at one last meeting we're going to potentially have it approved i don't feel comfortable with it needs more time so i agree with mr sandy whoa all right <laughs> um i guess i do i have reservations about voting for something that everybody's expressing concern about it seems though so that there would be more of a path forward to have the designated area and that with Mr. Swanson's review there would be I, what you're proposing seems to actually fit better with more of a designated um, separation between the two areas and that there might actually be a way forward with that um, potentially without changing the code if Mr. Swanson had a little more insight into the plans and maybe if there were some shuffling of areas or something like that. I mean, when you're talking about the ax throwing, um, I've seen it on TV because I have terrible taste in TV. So like, I, I know what you're talking about because I've seen it, but um, it seems like if you were gonna have youth doing that, you might have a designated league night or something of that nature anyway, or some designated hours 
where we might be far closer to that compromise point than what we're thinking. What I would uh, logical. What I yes, would uh, advise <laughs> council that I will do is I will post on the National City Attorney's list server request if there are any other cities that have allowed axe throwing on a licensed premise, which also permits minors. I'll see if I can get that information. I am aware of some Minnesota cities that have given approval to axe throwing. I'll reach out to my colleagues in Minnesota that I know and see what they've done. If Mr. Lee knows of locations that have done this, if he could give me those leads, I can follow up. But I can provide you with a broader uh, scope of information. As it was today, I just didn't know what the plan was, and my concern was that he was anticipating one thing, and the code wouldn't allow that. And I, I was pretty confident that he didn't appreciate uh, those implications. Mr. Weigel? Would my colleagues be more interested if I were to amend my motion that we look at a specific designated area instead of the, because I agree with you, I don't want the, the, the parent or anybody else with a beer down by the bouncy houses, I want them to be in a, in a designated area. Would there be more support for it that way versus the full facility? So, Ms. Marshall, would you um, something yeah, I, I can address your question and just my thoughts in general. I, um, you know, I, I have to agree that this feels really rushed. And I know that you mentioned the middle of October wanting to begin with this and there's nothing that from what I can see that would prevent you from uh, going forward with the axe throwing element of it. Uh, I just feel like, it, it, as uh, Mr. Vian and, and Sandy have indicated already, that this feels rushed and it feels like we're trying, that we've spent the last hour trying to uh, do problem solving on an issue that there maybe wasn't enough communication about or that uh, wasn't there wasn't enough information to think it through uh, to uh, the conclusion or, or to the place where it would be a real saleable idea to us. So rather than vote on either uh, one or the other, it, it makes sense to me that we would just give it time, uh, give you an opportunity to kind of refine and rework the proposal and bring back one that, that um, addresses the concern that, that were raised tonight and then have you know the chance for us to have a second shot at it at the next meeting after that that would be yeah, I, I, in general I agree I feel like mr. Lee should be better educated on our current liquor licenses and then he can make a decision as to whether he can try to find an area where he can make it work where they can throw I don't care if they throw knives or whatever um, but Miners aren't allowed in that in that premises when alcohol is being uh, sold, and so he can decide if that's what's in the best interest of his business. And if it's not, then he can come back to us and ask us to create a new license or amend a license for him. Uh, otherwise, we could be here all night trying to figure out what what he should do for his business. So, I yeah, Mr. Ruggle. Uh, I would like. To, can I withdraw my motion or amend my motion? You can withdraw. You're welcome to withdraw your motion. It, 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 Mr. Weber would have to agree to that. I'll withdraw my motion. Great. So is there a motion to table for three weeks until the next Committee of the Whole? I'll Even make that motion. Moved by Weigel, second by Marshall. Any other comments? Seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Lee. We'll look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. I'm good. Thank you. Item 2.2, appointment of growth fund committee, uh, Mr. Holth. Anybody have any comments or questions about Mr. Holth? Move approval. Moved by Weigel, second by Marshall. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And opposed, same sign. Motion carries 2.3, award bid 2019-31, Public Works Sanitation Division, Rear Load Refuse Truck. Ms. Amundsen, good evening. Good evening, President Sandy, members of the committee. Uh, the Public Works Operations Division is replacing a rear load refuse truck. And the new unit will replace a 2002 Peterbilt truck. Um, the city received three bids from three vendors for those trucks. And payment for the truck will be from the uh, current year's budget and amended into next year when we will receive it. We anticipate receiving it in the spring of 2020. 
And with that, uh, staff requests to approve bids for the rear load truck. And as per the following and attached bid tabulation, award bid to Fargo Freightliner in the amount of $144,931. And approve the associated budget amendment upon review and approval of the finance department. Any questions for Ms. Amundsen? Mr. Mr. Veen moves, second by Marshall. Well, any other comments? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries 2.4. Or bid project 8073 communications cabling for all city buildings good evening good evening <coughs> president sandy members of uh, council uh, this is a, a project that we've been working on i brought it to you about a year ago to get funding for it uh, it's part of our master infrastructure uh, rebuild telephone system uh, network switching this is kind of the first step that's going to be replacing all of the cabling in our uh, about eight of our buildings city hall uh, police department uh, four of our fire stations, public works building, and the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, so we went out to bid. We had a mandatory tour for all, all bidders uh, where they were able to go through, look at all of the buildings, see what was uh, what the responsibilities were going to be on their end, uh, look at uh, communications, closets, furniture layout, those types of things. Uh, we had four local vendors that showed up. Uh, three of those put in bids, uh, and tonight we're asking for you to... Uh, approve the concept in full which when we went out to bid uh, we did city hall as a base bid and then we did the other eight buildings as alternates just so we could kind of verify cost and know what we were uh, getting into the total cost of the uh, lowest bid was two hundred and seventy seven thousand two hundred and fifty dollars and we'd like to go with that entire concept so all of the buildings are the same all of our wiring is standardized across the city. Uh, everything that we're doing would be taking all of our CAT5 cable out, putting in CAT6, uh, CAT6A in some areas, uh, and fiber connects between all of our communication closets. So uh, what we're asking for tonight is approval of construction bid, award the contract uh, or the bid in full to RBB Electric uh, in the amount of $277,250. Any questions? Mr. Bean moves, second by Mock. A question, Ms. Mock? Um, any, it seems like there's quite a bit of variability between some of the bidders. Any concern that one is that much lower? We, we, we know right now there's some, some, some difference in, um, just in, we've, we've done a couple projects. We just finished a project over at PSAP as well that involved uh, quite a bit of cabling. Uh, we saw the same uh, amount of variability in it, so we were expecting it a little bit. Um, I was surprised at, at how much uh, was involved with it. Uh, RBB did get the bid at PSAP as well, and they completed that project. And PSAP, PSAP IT uh, in the city was extremely happy with the work that they did, so we feel comfortable moving forward. There's no utility in the, the CAT 5 that's going to be pulled out? No, and by a lot of code, it's uh, required to be pulled out. So uh, we can't leave it terminated in the closet and just hanging uh, vacant in the wall. So, so yeah, a demo is required on it as well. Great. Any other co comments? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Item 2.5, change order for product. Project 8005 2019 City Sidewalks. Mr. Duxer, good evening. Good evening, Council President Sandy, members of the Council. Uh, this is the project where requests are taken to install new or remove and replace existing sidewalks citywide. Um, due to the number of requests we have received from residents and along, <coughs> excuse me, along with the requests we have received from the Park District to utilize our contractor to complete a number of projects. We will exceed the original uh, anticipation for this contract. Um, so change order one is over the city's city engineer's authorization limit and requires city council approval. All costs for this change order will be assessed to benefiting properties. Uh, so staff would recommend approval of change order one in the amount of $119,800 for project number 8005 and reta retain the city engineer's 15% change order approval authority. Any questions? Sidewalks. This mock moves approval. Second by Weber. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. 
Item 2.6, change order and funding for projects numbers 7436 and 37, districts 518 and 323, Sanitary Water Main on North 62nd and Gateway Drive. Mr. Walker, good evening. Good evening, Council President Sandy, members of the Council. Um, so this project consisted of installing sanitary sewer and water main in one of the areas that uh, the city had determined to be a SIG area. It's out on 62nd and Gateway. This is the location where Steffes is, uh, has their facility. Um, we started this project back in 2017. We actually bid the project and the project came in at a, uh, a bid amount of $1.9 million. So it was a rather large project, fairly expensive, and it was, uh, it was a project that was, was very difficult. We knew that when we bid the project that we would have some difficulties, and when we got into the project, we experienced a, a, a few more difficulties. So uh, what you have before you is change order number three, and uh, I just want to tell you that change order number one and number two were approved under the city engineer's authority. The city engineer has 10% uh, uh, of the original bid, uh, that authority, to, to approve change orders. Um, and uh, change orders number one and number two included uh, extending the sanitary sewer that was installed and it also changed the method as to how the sanitary sewer was installed as it crossed uh, Highway 2. We had to cross Highway 2 with a, with a sanitary sewer. So the attached change order number three, which is before you for approval tonight, included a, a number of things. We had to relocate a significant section of rural water main that wasn't anticipated. We had to connect some uh, sanitary, excuse me, some uh, water service connections. We had to repair a leaky water main valve, and there were a number of different bid items that we uh, had originally un underestimated that when it got to the to actually constructing the project. It just took more work and we had to pay more of the bid items to, to get that work completed. Uh, just a little bit about the, the rural water main. When we originally um, called for locates and determined where everything was, we thought that we had a clear path and the water main was located a fair distance away from where we were putting in the sanitary sewer. However, when we excavated it to put in the sanitary sewer, there was a water main and we had to, to relocate it and it was, it was a, a rather significant cost. Anyway, um, change order number one and number two accounted to 5.6% of the original bid amount and with this change order number three, that now brings that amount to 10.9, which exceeds that 10% city engineer's authority. So that's why it's, it's before you tonight. So, uh, in addition to seeking approval on change order number three, staff is also suggesting that an additional city share be applied to the project. Originally, this, when this project was bid, there was a city share of $672,000 that was attached to this, to this project. There were a number of unique things that we knew we were going to encounter when we, when we bid the project. And we thought that that would be appropriate that the city pay for uh, those expenses as opposed to being special assessed. Um, the sewer that we were installing was, was very deep. We were trying to serve a very large area with a single lift station. Having hindsight on this one, it would probably made a, a better choice to install two sanitary sewer lift stations, but they're rather expensive and we were trying to uh, get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, the soils in that area were very uh, wet, uh, very soft, and they also paralleled, the, the sanitary sewer paralleled a two force mains that had been previously installed some time ago by the city. One was the major uh, force main for the city for wastewater, and another one was a force main that carried uh, residuals or the waste materials from the water treatment plant. So we knew we couldn't disrupt those without significant impact to those two facilities. The installation of the sanitary sewer was specified to be by digging a borehole at one location, three or 400 feet away, digging another one, and then boring a steel casing pipe from one uh, pit to another, and then installing a sanitary sewer inside of it. The cost of that is relatively expensive, and uh, we felt that the cost of that above the normal installation of open cutting installation 
should be a city's cost. We estimated that cost to be $672,000, which is the reason for the original $672,000 city share. So as we got into the project, I told you that one of the change orders was to amend the way that we were crossing the sanitary sewer uh, underneath Highway 2. A contractor tried to do that. He, he was unable to do that. He ran into a number of difficulties with soil conditions and upheave of the, of the, the, uh, uh, the bore pits. And eventually, we had to change order uh, the installation from a steel casing pipe to a directional drill. So the cost of that, as well as the cost to relocate the rural water main, we felt should be a city expense rather than special assessing it to the benefiting property owners. That cost we estimate to be around $205,000, which is the reason we're suggesting that the city participate an additional city share of $205,000. If that is approved, uh, we've discussed that with the uh, finance department and uh, the additional share would come from a funding force that would funding source that would match the original 672,000, which was 60% uh, from economic development fund because it is a SIG area and 40% from the, the wastewater fund. With that in mind, our, our recommendation is to approve change order number three in the amount of $99,061.99 and approve additional funding of uh, city funding in the amount of $205,000 and approve any necessary budget amendments for this project. Well, that was great, Mr. Walker. Any, uh, Mr. Weigel moves approval for a second. Second, second by Veen. Comments? Yes, Mr. Weber. It, um, I'm trying to understand uh, where this is at. Uh, this is a, a, an industrial area, right? Yes. Uh, so if you're, if you're traveling on, on Highway 2 going out towards the airport, uh, if you know where the Steffes building is, yeah, it's in that area. Uh, also, there is uh, the crematorium, there is, um, uh, I forgot the uh, topper place, uh, what it's, uh, New Vision. Uh, that, that's the area right there. Very good, thanks. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 27, design, bidding, and construction. Administration Engineering Services Agreement for Project 8108, Pump Station 183, Safety Upgrades, and Pump Station 194, Controls, Flaps, and Gates. Mr. Walker. So uh, this is an engineering agreement to design, bid, and construct, uh, or to, to uh, engineer the construction uh, of a project that would make improvements on two uh, uh, storm sewer pump stations. Uh, Station 183 is located at 401 South Washington. Primarily, that serves the Washington Street underpass as it goes underneath the railroad tracks. And uh, we know that the North Dakota DOT is looking at uh, doing something with the underpass, and they'll likely do something with the pump station as well. Uh, they haven't determined yet if that's going to be a very near future project or if that's something that's going to be down the road a ways. They're now evaluating the structure to determine how soon this project is needed. But we feel, and the Stormwater Department feels, that there are some improvements that need to be made that are are uh, very uh, critical safety deficiencies, and we, we need to to uh, repair those. So that's included in this project. The, the other pump station, 194, is located at 55th and Gateway, primarily drains uh, Gateway Drive from about the uh, 5,000 block to uh, 55th uh, Street. And uh, at that location, we have a controller that uh, frequently malfunctions. We like to replace it. And then that station is set up where it can drain uh, by gravity uh, and by pumping and to control uh, when the water uh, gets to a certain level that the, doesn't come back there are what's called flap gates on the end of the pipes 
and uh, they open up when the water needs to flow out, but when the water starts back flowing back in, they close up and stop it. They're not sealing appropriately, and we really need to replace those because with, the, with them leaking, it just causes the pumps to uh, continually run. So uh, we feel that this is a project that we should uh, move forward with. Uh, the funding for the project would come out of the stormwater uh, uh, station fund, 5400, and it would be our recommendation to approve task order agreement with uh, Webster, Foster, and Weston for design, bidding, and construction administration engineering services in the amount of $66,182. Thank you, Mr. Weiler. Moved by Weber, second by Dockler. Any other questions? Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Walker. I'm 2.8 or bid project 8057 fiber connection from the Purple Water Tower to the Viking Water Tower. And good evening. Good evening, President Sorry. Sandy and members of the council. Um, tonight we're working on a project, just as uh, Mr. Sandy said, to include the fiber from um, Purple Tower to Viking Tower. And um, we haven't opened the bids yet. We'll do that tomorrow. So if we can, ask you to forward it to council and then we'll update that um, council staff report as soon as we get those bids um, tomorrow afternoon or even Wednesday once we're able to verify the numbers on those. Part of this project also includes the networking equipment that goes with um, lighting up the fiber. So um, we're excited to get the project bid and awarded yet this year so that we can accomplish that task as well. The engineer's estimates at $330,000 as well. And we have the money. We do. It's exciting. Anyone, Mr. Weber, moves approval, mock seconds. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All the same sign, motion carries. Last but not least, 2.9, request from MPO to initiate hydraulic studies at potential bridge locations. Uh, get a staff report, MPO review, and uh, relevant East Grand Fork City Council. Yes? Council President Sandy. What's your feeling? Uh, if I give a quick summary, um, I attended a meeting uh, of the MPO, and uh, as part of that uh, work with uh, both East Grand Forks and Grand Forks, uh, out of that meeting was to determine, uh, let's take a look at the hydraulic, uh, do a hydraulic evaluation of three distinct sites so that um, before we go too far down the road of, of studying the location, we may find out it's not going to work from a hydrology perspective. So out of that meeting, um, we did recommend uh, the MPO move forward with three sites, Elks Drive, 32nd Avenue South, and 47th Avenue South. So they're um, three distinct areas. Uh, obviously, 32nd Avenue South is on the south end of the East Grand Flood Forks flood protection. Elks Drive would be right in the midst of both of ours. And then 47th is within our flood protection area and, and outside of the East Grand Forks flood protection area. So they'd give us a flavor of three. And um, I think as Mr. Vina said, the further south you go, probably the less um, flood protection impacts that you may have as you move forward. So um, out of that, um, East Grand Forks uh, changed things up a little bit. And as part of that agreement, because uh, Elks and 32nd were part of Kind of the original study let's take a look i think out of that original kind of committee meeting that they would share 50 50 in that cost share but would not share in the 47th because that was outside of their city limits so uh, ultimately what happened east grand forks only approved one of the sites which is 32nd they approved at a 50 50 cost share um subject to your to your approval um, um how would however we move forward uh, we would use funds. Um, we have uh, funds set aside in the, uh, for flood protection, um, analysis, construction, that sort of thing. So I think this is a hydro hydraulic analysis. So we would use those funds that we set aside um, for um, those projects that relate to the flood protection system. I think that's appropriate as we move forward. And I know um, Mayor Brown is not here, but um, I asked that 47th Avenue South be added because I know that's a uh, some area that he wants studied. So it did get incorporated as an addition. Obviously, East Grand Forks did not weigh in on that particular point. Um, uh, Mayor Brown's concern on 32nd is uh, if we don't intend on moving forward with that location due to the disruption of that neighborhood, let's not start studying something that we don't want to move forward with, um, um, I guess, regardless. So that, that's kind of a stance. I'm not sure how we feel if we include 47th in as part of that um, suite of options that we have in front of us. And so I don't know that answer, but um, with that, I think that's a, a summary. I, I know Hyro is here. I don't see Mr. Haugen here, but Hyro is here on behalf of the MPO if you have any specific questions. And I know Mr. Grasser was at the MPO executive board meeting too, along with uh, Ms. Mock, I think was there. I think Mr. Vian, uh, I'm not sure if you were there, but uh, 
you were there firsthand as part of um, the MPO Executive Board. I was not at East Grand Forks City Council meeting either. So with that, I'd hand it back over to you, Mr. Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Phelan. There's a move by Weber, the staff, re staff recommendation. Is there a second? Second by Muff. Further discussion? Ms. Marshall? I have um, a question, I guess, about, uh, and if anyone knows, the rationale why East Grand Forks denied a 50-50 share of the Elks Drive crossing? Uh, President Sandy and Council Member uh, Marshall, I understood it was more of a cost issue of let's, let's study one and maybe we can see what the results of a, a 32nd. It's kind of the midpoint, we'll say, between Elks and 47th. Let's study the midpoint and based on those results, perhaps we don't need to move forward with further analysis. So I think it was more of an incremental mindset or a thought process of let's not do all three at 90,000 when we can do one at 30. Maybe those re results will help inform us so that we can narrow future choices. So I, I think it was kind of an incremental, uh, let's do one, see how it works out, and then maybe we don't have to do the full suite of all three of them. That's a concern to me. I would find it easier to approve going forward if if there were if all three or if two of the three sites were were going to be looked at uh, and and paid for by East Grand Forks as well equally uh, to exclude that uh, uh, Elks Drive uh, makes it less appealable to me or uh, appealing to me uh, to. Uh, go forward with this. I'm just uh, concerned about the message that that sends and and maybe the intention behind it. Yeah. And Council President Sandy, I think it is contingent. So whatever we uh, pass, and I guess it's going to have to go two weeks from today, obviously it will be back in their court. Right now it's in your court. We pass something and they'll have to consider what you, what you finally approve as part of moving forward. Um, I think uh, as part of the staff report, just so you know, I think uh, Mr. Grasser on behalf of the engineering, he's, he's suggesting that we go through a um, a request for qualifications process where we would choose to pick the best firm um, to conduct this analysis and then secondarily we uh, negotiate um, a fee based upon whatever the scope of work is so that's what we're that's what we're asking for us to move forward with that process and at some point we're going to come back with a, a firm that's the best qualified um, that we believe and number two is it an agreement with a dollar amount too mr wagle I'll, I'll just be brief um my plan is to vote no on this. I, I don't think, I'm not in favor of a 32nd Avenue South Bridge as it is right now. We've had people um, in this very room uh, a couple months ago, maybe longer, talk about how they weren't in favor of it um, from that neighborhood. So I'm not a fan of spending money on something that uh, our citizens aren't gonna support widely. So um, just a heads up that I'm not in favor of this. Ms. Marshall? And I've uh, really thought on both sides of this this issue uh, in terms of if it was just 32nd, then absolutely I, I would say no. If it's all three, then you know we might get some additional information that would help us to know um, is are any of those three sites off the table or on the table and how, how does it compare one versus the other. Uh, so. But, but I also share some of the thoughts um, of Mr. Weigel, too, of why spend money on something if, if there's no intent of going forward with it, uh, despite the fact that 32nd is in the plan, uh, which is you know kind of confounding to me. Uh, you know, I, I see some folks in the audience, and I don't know if now is a time when Certainly. people might want to speak to the issue. Are there people here that issue. may want to speak to the issue? If so, come to the microphone, state your name for the record. Hi, my name is Randy Menard. I live at 110 32nd Avenue South. I have an obvious biased opinion on where that bridge should or shouldn't go. But I just heard from this gentleman that East Grand Forks withdrew a 50-50 offer. So now we got it seems like we got the tail wagging the dog on where it's going to go just on based on that um, at a couple other meetings i brought up a few things but um, 
again, I'm biased, but if I lived on 47th Avenue, you can drive down that street and you can see it was built with egress or liens or whatever the city easements are a couple hundred feet back. And I know that's not what's up for voting tonight, but I would sure like you to consider not participating in something that we're throwing a six figure dollar amount over something that's already facing some pretty good opposition with high and middle ranking individuals in the Grand Forks community. Because East Grand Forks population of 8,600 wants to control where the bridge goes. And we've got 57,000 on our side of the bridge, wherever it may go. So please vote no. Thank you, sir. Anyone else interested in speaking up? Any other? Please. Hello, Council. Um, Lisa Simonson, 3123 Olson Drive. Um, I tend to get very emotional about this. So basically, I'm having a hard time understanding why there's so much money to be spent on a study of when we already know that that's going to be a low bridge. I mean, to me, it just doesn't make any sense. Also, the fact that East Grand Forks pulls back and is only going to 50-50 um, on the 32nd. We've been fighting this for a long time. I just really want you guys to vote no so we can put this aside. And 47th or Maryfield is the other option. We are moving south. We, we're already at 67th Street, building homes and streets going in and everything. And it's just, I completely sympathize with the Phoenix Elementary Schools and everything, but it just doesn't make any sense to just take that and then move over another it's already congested already and we haven't even got a bridge there you know i just it I, I don't know what else more to say to that just vote no um we're just we're tired of this and we just really want to get on thank you thank you miss marshall um yeah i do have a question about what we're voting on uh, and the staff report talks about to prepare a scope of work and advertise for qualifications <laughs> a request for qualifications. Uh, if we did that, does that lock us into doing, uh, and, well, and it says, it quotes the three, three sites. So if we receive that information, would we then have another shot at, at voting on whether or not to proceed with an actual hydraulic study at any of the locations? City Council President, Council Member Marshall. Yes, you're gonna get another shot because we're gonna bring back uh, eventually a, a, an agreement um, that will have a scope and fee attached to it. Um, and then you will have an opportunity to vote on, on whether or not to move forward with that agreement. Okay, so if we voted for that, it doesn't necessarily indicate that we're in favor of a 32nd Avenue bridge versus anywhere else, it just is. Uh, to allow you to take that next step. Yeah, correct? I think I think what we would do, uh, Councilmember Marshall, is we would designate as part of the scope that uh, we want the uh, engineering firm to have the capability to um, do hydraulic analysis. We would specify three locations uh, that we want examined, and eventually, once we pick the best firm, um, we're going to negotiate. If if you had all three sites in there, we're going to negotiate for all three locations. That agreement with that firm is going to come back to you for final review and approval at that point in time. And the only reason why you wouldn't do it is it's always good to be as clear as possible before you start advertising um, for services as if we can. But ultimately, most firms are gonna know it has to come back. Number one, we have to choose the firm and we have to move forward with the agreement and the dollar amount uh, as we move forward. So you'll have one more shot at reviewing this. Mr. B? A question for Mr. Grasser. Um, <laughs> From a, from a pricing standpoint, um, the, first, the first river crossing we do is going to be the most expensive one, right? And then the second and the third one, or even if you went beyond that, would be able to use some of the data that was produced when we did the first one uh, for the basis, right? Well, as, as, as I'm envisioning the process, one of the first main tasks that, that a consultant will have to do is is update the hydrology, which is the flows and stuff in the river. 
and those flows will be very similar, I think, for all three of these, loca these particular locations that we're talking about. The second major task they're gonna have to do is validate the cross section so they know what that river cross section looks like so they can calculate, again, any hydraulic impacts. Um, so there are some, there is some of that work that's going to be common to all three. Again, let's take, uh, let's take 47th Avenue South, for instance. Once they get the cross section and the flows, they can analyze probably different heights of bridge, bridge crossings. And I don't think that, that cost will be near as much per analysis as if you just did one, because a lot of the effort is gonna go into developing that, that, that basic data, if that makes sense. So there is, a, there is some savings quantity of scale, um, again, that, that, that goes with them. But each individual location will take a significant amount of work getting the cross section and those kinds of things. But again, the hydrology that goes into it, I think is gonna be very common too, whether we do one or whether we do three locations or whether we do alternate heights. Right, and I was, guess I was, was trying to say is, is uh, the long range transportation plan shows 32nd, but I think in the MPO, we decided to expand on that, not just to take what was in there, to take into account some of the neighborhood issues and feelings were uh, for both those locations. So at least on the, on the Grand Fork side, we said, let's just not stay with the plan that's been approved, but expanded. And then we would have better data to be able to establish which one may or may not work. Um, there's, you know, we, we want to look at, first of all, it's supposed to be a low uh, bridge crossing. Uh, at what elevation can even any one of those get put in? Will it be useful or not. There's a lot of information yet to be determined um, before any final decision would be. But this opened it up to be able to allow us to look at a couple other locations because there's, it's been an emotional issue for many and we need to try to address that. And we can do that hopefully with some factual uh, data that's, that's produced by the consultant that we hire. Um, and I'm wondering also, um, if at the, as a part of this, or I'm probably not as a part of this, but later on, when we are looking at the hydrology through Grand Forks, if we could then take this information, or would this be a part of it as we've looked at the downstream impacts of Fargo diversion and what that would mean for us, would that somehow get incorporated into this as you're looking at the flows through town? So we could also address that because legislatively that was put in the session this last year and there might be some ability to be able to actually do these two. <coughs> They'd naturally flow together, would they not? That is the basis of my assumption at this point in time. Uh, when, we, when we did the, the, our flood protection project, the Corps of Engineers had hydrology and hydraulics. That's the, the flow through, through Grand Forks. And all, those things have changed. I believe the best available information right now on flows, which is the hydrology part of it, is the Red River diversion, uh, wet weather period of record that, that, that they determine. So I'm, in my mind, I'm operating on that assumption at this point in time. If I could, again, maybe going back on, on one of the previous questions. So if we, if the council approves this at the at, at city council meeting, what'll happen, we'll go out, we'll advertise for, for qualifications, we'll, we'll meet with those, we'll have an interview process, we'll start developing a contract uh, with one of the selected individuals. And with that, uh, I think one of the big things that we're gonna get is a better idea of the cost. I mean, I have to be honest, we don't do these kinds of bridge, hyd bridge hydraulic analysis very often. The $30,000, I don't have a high level of faith as to how accurate that is, high or low. And so I think if we have that, that inf we'll have better information if we go through this process relative to cost. And uh, I have no idea, again, what $30,000 is a number that we've been using at this point just to get, a, 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 again, a general sense uh, of what it's going to take. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Phelan, do you think then with the discussion we've had, um, I don't think the City Council for East Grand Forks has a final decision that we could, we could work with them again at this cost year? Council President Sandy and Council Member Bean, I think we can work with them. I, I think this was a opening opportunity for you to review is how I see it, not a final. Mr. Weigel. 
I'm, I'm just struggling with the idea that we are willing to spend money to study something that has little to no support. I just keep thinking about that. Why? That'd be like saying we're going to build a police department west of town where nobody wants a police department or a fire department. Why would we even consider spending the money when there is no support for it? Mr. Weber? In, in this room, it, it's been mentioned before that we've heard people in this room. In this room, I've, I've seen large groups of people from wards three and four um, very supportive of, of a South End Bridge. And since 2003, for various reasons and in various iterations, there has been a vote from this body to move forward with the recommendations for 32nd Avenue Bridge. Now, those are just recommendations to move forward and get more information. So the recommendation has been to move forward with studying 32nd. There's been opposition to that. And so the uh, range has now been extended to 32nd, Elks, and 47th. This study actually might be one of the opponents to, to 32nd, this might be one of your best tools to putting this to bed. In fact, it's my understanding, and I'm, I'm not an engineer in any way, but as the, the uh, flood protection narrows, the, um, the hydraulics may make this, uh, may make 32nd and Elks a less favorable situation than 47th. There's a possibility that this study could demonstrate that 47th or somewhere further south is actually uh, the, the superior bridge. We're not going to know until we do the study. This, this is about getting information. Now, we've just, in our, I think our last three or four agenda items, approved well in excess of a million dollars. Good expenses. I mean, these were things that needed to be done. There were valves to be need, that needed repair and, and other things. To get the information for this really important piece of our infrastructure over the next decades, uh, we're talking, well, we, we don't know the exact dollar amount right now, but we're talking about anticipated city share of $75,000. To get information that helps us make good decisions going forward. So we want to make uh, data-driven data -driven decisions rather than emotional decisions, let's get that information. And, and now, instead of just getting that information for 32nd, we've expanded that to get information for 32nd, Elks Drive, and 47th. In the process, I believe that whoever's studying this, a lot of the same information will go into it. One piece, which will be critically important, is the uh, diversion project down in Fargo. How is that going to change our flood risk here in Grand Forks. That's an important thing that changes all the previous votes because all the previous support for 32nd was done before the diversion project was approved at the last legislative session. So this is simply about getting in information. This is not committing to any one bridge. This is getting information to help us, oh, maybe put some of these options to bed for once and for all. So. Uh, I'm, I, I appreciate the staff recommendation. I, m I made the motion to support this, and, and uh, I'm, I'm ready to vote when, when the rest of us are. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. Of course. Any other? Ms. Marshall? Yeah, I um, have, you know, I guess what makes this more palatable to me is knowing that it's just putting out a request for qualifications. It doesn't commit us to spending the money uh, on any of the sites. Is that, is that correct? Uh, this is a really probably naive question as someone who's as far from an engineer as you could get. Uh, if we do hydraulic studies now and the city doesn't get funding to build a bridge till 20 years from now, will those hydraulic studies still be accurate or will they have to be redone? There will be some components of yes to both of those questions and some components of no. You know me, I never give 100% easy. But I mean, if you're talking 20 years from now, there's probably going to be some updated hydrology. Having said that, if the cross sections and things are the same and you're just increasing the flow, that's a pretty, pretty minor and easy change, but it, it may not be exactly what it is today. But I think to update that would be relatively minor cost. You just have to input whatever the, the, uh, 
computer model to Jure is at that time to update it. So in 20 years, things are likely going to change. But there's a lot of value that we'll create today that I think will still be useful. Mr. Krasser, yeah, any other comments? Who, Ms. Monk? Who's the, who's the chair of the MPO today? Uh, uh, Clarence Vetter. I should know that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Council member. Yes. I, uh, I, I read all of the all of the detailed information that was provided. I also, and thank you for, for providing that info. I also emailed Mr. Haugen today for the minutes from the Wednesday, August 21st uh, MPO Executive Policy Board, although they aren't, they haven't been voted on by the MPO Policy Board. They're, they're apparently, uh, so they aren't official, um, but I believe they will be voted on at the next meeting. There were some things in here that I found really interesting. Um, and, and if you bear with me for a second. Um, Mr. Hogan reported that on June, then at the June MPO Executive Policy Board meeting, staff, the MPO board had asked staff to put together a scope of work um, to uh, specific to the 32nd Avenue Bridge feasibility. He said that included in the packet is a draft of that scope of work. So bear with me, it was 17 pages. I'm not gonna read all 17 pages, but you're all welcome to email Mr. Hogan and get this for, him, for yourselves. Um, Mr. Strandell asked how the study differs from previous studies. What new information did it obtain? Mr. Hogan responded that right now, the 32nd Avenue corridor from the long range transportation plan, we've identified it from a metropolitan point of view, beneficial from a traffic operation standpoint. Mr. Grasser, side question. Do you know what year was the information used for the, for the traffic data when they simulated the traffic study for the new bridge locations? Mr. Hagel, you were at the meeting the, uh, the other day with the neighborhood. I don't remember what year it was, but I rem remember thinking to myself, it sure was a long time ago, the data that they used for the traffic study. 2015 is my recollection of what they're using for the, the base for the traffic modeling. Got it. Okay. Not as old as I recall. Um, later during that meeting, um, um, Commissioner Ross stated that he doesn't feel that 32nd Avenue is going to be viable. Uh, 2045, comma, he thinks that all of those driveways all dump onto 32nd Avenue, the schools, that is going to be a huge safety issue. He said that he just doesn't think it's a good site to put a bridge. He doesn't think it's going to work. You can do all the studying you want. He just doesn't think it's going to be a popular place to put a bridge. It's not going to... It's just not going to do it, but no matter what you do, no matter what study you do. Later on, Mr. Veen, who is very wise, um, stated uh, that we will always have neighborhood impacts, and he doesn't know if there will ever be a perfect solution, but we have to try, and he thought at least the study would help us determine. If we let it continue to hang out there, then these people on 32nd will all be left in limbo because we won't know anything until we do the study. So that is why he actually thinks that it's advantageous for everyone, even on 32nd, to do the study. At least we will have more details than we have today because we don't have all the data we needed. So that is why he was in support of doing the studies. The same thing he said tonight. Um, then uh, a very, very smart city engineer asked, if when you do a project concept report or a final report, would you normally have to look at alternatives to which Mr. Hogan replied, yes. Grassler then said, um, asked if those alternatives would probably go back and consider other bridge locations, to which Mr. Hogan reported that they could. It depends on how you scope your project concept. Mr. Grasser said then, not Mr. Grasser, a very smart city engineer then said, hmm, I'm going to have to go back. Some of the things that, uh, that the engineer was struggling with is, yes, we have 32nd Avenue South location in the long range transportation plan. But it is probably there not so much as recognizing that that is a good location, other than it was a requirement to get the long-range transportation plan done. So we kind of picked one, knowing it had its challenges. But he agrees that in, 
in his mind, he doesn't just see 32nd Avenue ever being viable from a political or financial standpoint, and he is struggling that that would be a good choice. So two people, very smart people, in my opinion, said that they didn't think that 32nd Avenue would be a good place. He went on to say he's trying to combine and compromise a number of things. He thinks that Elk should probably stay on the list, 32nd is already there, and he thinks 42nd, 47th has been identified by the mayor, which we've noted tonight. He said that his thought is that maybe we should look into expanding the scope. He is going to suggest the three locations and, and going um, through uh, to throw that out there for discussion, which is how we ended up going beyond 32nd Avenue to studying Elks and 47th. I thought it was very wise. In the, uh, in the end, when the question was called, and I have five pages in between that was all the discussion about the three concepts, and everyone should read it. So I'm definitely picking and choosing my, my words, right? Everybody knows that. I'm very honest. But when they voted for it, it was uh, Strandell, Mock, Grasser, Rost, and Veen voted for. And the three that voted against were Vetter, Powers, and Demers. Does anybody know the difference between those two groups of people? Everyone in East Grand Forks voted against the concept. But those affiliated... Grand Forks voted for it. No. It leads me to a question. Um, and why, why I ask the question, who's the, who's the chair of the MPO board? Um, I've also got the East Grand Forks City Council September 10th meeting minutes. I'm sure you've looked at them. Council Member Vetter, who is the chair of the board, stated since the 32nd Avenue Bridge is in the long, it's in the long range transportation plan, uh, the MPO has started looking at what needs to be done to continue this process. He explained they did a feasibility study for Marifel Bridge location, so the MPO board was asking to have one completed for 32nd Avenue Bridge location and to include three specific areas, blah, blah, blah. He added how scope does keep, seem to keep changing each time, but each time 32nd Avenue comes back as the best location. And it is his, his recommendation to participate only in the 32nd Avenue hydraulic study at this time. Later on, Council President Olstead asked how they would like to move forward. Again, Council Member Vetter, against the wishes of the board that he chairs, suggests he would, he would like to only move forward with 32nd Avenue. But he does throw in the caveat that if that will not work for Grand Forks, we can amend it later to Elks Drive. I was very interested in all of that information, and um, I, I, I'm going to take the blame personally for us being in this situation today. This is all my fault. It is. I will take 100% responsibility for this because I was on planning and zoning 11 years ago when Mr. Haugen stood in front of us and said, eh, 32nd Avenue Bridge location, eh, it's just a placeholder goes in there, we need it for federal funding. We have to have something in, in the long range transportation plan. I will take personal responsibility that I went along with that. I've been telling the neighbors myself, same thing when I talked to previous council president Gershman. You don't ever go on 32nd hour. Doug Christensen, Kurt Kroon. I can go down the list all night long of all the people that used to sit here and used to vote for these things, knowing full well Everybody had been told, eh, it's never going to go to 32nd Avenue. So I blame myself. I'm sorry, and I'm sorry to everyone that lives by the, the Point Bridge. And I'm sorry to everyone that lives out by 32nd. Mr. Veen feels bad that the folks on 32nd Avenue are still in the situation. And I agree with his philosophy, which is why I believe today, at this moment, because I've been telling everyone, and they've been telling being told this for years that we're not going to put the bridge in their backyard we should take 30 seconds off the table tonight eliminate it from all the studies let's move a elk study let's move a 47th avenue study forward and let's put the 32nd avenue issue to bed for good and if you guys disagree that's okay i i have no hard feelings so that's my 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 speech thanks any anybody want to retort i'm sure everyone mr weber sure but that was, I think, your longest speech. And uh, I had no idea where it was going. 
uh, because a lot of the things that you were saying seem to confirm the need for studying all three bridges. And then somehow you took all of the things that you said and, and made it a conclusion at the end that, that seemed contradictory to what had gone on for the first 15 minutes. Um, and so uh, again, uh, 47th doesn't work for the fo folks on East Grand Forks at this time because East Grand Forks doesn't go that far south. Their town simply doesn't go that far south. And so we would end up having to pay for all of that bridge potentially. But maybe if, if we can demonstrate through data that that actually is the better bridge, uh, maybe instead of a Merrifield and 32nd, <coughs> maybe 47th works best for both sides. This study could help us to understand that. And that could save us the money of two bridges. We could have one uh, dry bridge uh, that, that might work. But we're not going to know until we do this study. Currently, the recommendation from this entity is to study 32nd. You, like you said, you're the one who's uh, had us go down the road of studying the three. And so I support your recommendation, and that's why I move to uh, vote in favor of the staff recommendation tonight. Um, and I agree with almost everything you said during that first 15 or 20 minutes, however. But I didn't understand that the last bit was a little bit off for me, but thanks. Any, any other comments? Oh. This is, come on up, you bet. Sorry. Please state your name for the record. Uh, Mike Hewitt, uh, third second in Belmont. I got a question. I'd be in favor that we're going to study the bridge. Okay, we can get across the bridge. That's cool. What's the cost once you get across the bridge? So if I cross from east side to 32nd, what's it cost this direction? Go east. Do we know? Uh, Mr. Weber? My understanding, and I need to check with Mr. Grasser, um, part of the what needs to still be studied would be if it were to work out that 32nd maybe makes sense for us, then we need to study the expense related to making sure that pedestrian and vehicular traffic in that, in that neighborhood <coughs> is, is assured safety because that has to be a, a number one concern. Um, now, if it doesn't work out to put a bridge there, we don't need to spend any money studying that. But that would be our next step. We're a long ways away from well, actually it, moving forward you, with sorry the Sorry to interrupt, but wouldn't it be, I mean, I wouldn't fill my tank full of gas and go someplace not knowing where's a gas station. If I can afford the car, but I can't find gas to put in it. So if I'm crossing 32nd and this study says this is going to cost X amount of million dollars, why even spend $70,000 on doing a hydraulic study? Because once you get across the bridge, you've got to know where you're going. You've got to know what it's going to cost. You've got to know what it's going to do. That seems to me a pertinent piece of the pie. And I'm not an engineer by no means, but I'm sure going to ask my question. What happens when I cross the bridge? Council President Sandy and Councilman, I think uh, as, as, as part of the cost-benefit analysis, there are some conceptual dollar amounts for, I think, at all the locations that were provided. How much of the details of, you know, buyouts and, and transportation safety, that's a question mark. So that's always a concern on a conceptual planning level estimate. And future studies would, uh, once you start narrowing choices, would start to look at those final details of what a cost estimate would be. But right now, they are conceptual numbers. They go into the cost-benefit analysis. And I think all these sites that have been looked at along the way have had uh, dollar amounts. And uh, obviously with 30 second whether you believe the cost benefit or not they have a dollar amount for what that bridge is going to estimate the cost i don't recall what it was l and i don't know how much details whether it's buyouts or how many details there are involved in that how high the bridge is and all that sort of thing yes those are all good questions i'm going to step back a little bit and um you know the the, the study to date was done by the mpos funded by the federal government primarily and for transportation related okay and that's why you saw in the everything or most of the things that have done to date were very very detailed relative to traffic impacts things like that my staff a lot of people have heard me talk about peeling the onion that is really the outside layer of the onion it's a very reconnaissance level so the 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 
The estimates that have done to, been done to date are at a very generic level meant to really compare just one alternative to the other to see if there's a big difference from one to the other based on a very limited and generic set of assumptions. That works fine uh, as a first step in comparing one alternative to the other. It's not necessarily a very good step to get to the actual final raw dollar amount or uh, you know a final conclusion. Again, that's the first layer of the onion. What we're talking about here with the hydraulics is starting to peel that next layer of the onions, trying to see, is there something else that comes out of, the, of this data that will weigh something pro or con from one, one location to the other? There are other steps after that. As was mentioned, there's, there's gonna be a need for more detailed uh, study, I think, on, on particularly school safety and other pedestrian safety connections, uh, came up at the at the at the ward meeting about you know how are you going to even stage construction? I think some of those things again that's not all going to happen with this hydraulic study. But the, as the engineer, there's going to be more studies that follow this. But right now we're very stymied in these three locations. I mean, some people are lots of people are very clear about one or the other, but we still I, I think we would prefer if there was something data driven that would eliminate or drive one over the other. And right now, all we're relying on is the traffic component. There are other components that really need to come together. And I think what we're struggling with here is I think the political piece wasn't fully vetted out in the, in, in the, in the beginning or the end of that long range transportation plan. So we're kind of vetting some of that in, in arrears. But sorry, that's a political comment, maybe not an engineering comment. But. I think um, Mr. Weber, um, I think part of, uh, Part of the point that I was trying to make, just to clarify, is uh, Mr. Vetter um, at the MPO meeting, it should have been very clear to him that the intestinal fortitude for 32nd Avenue was going to be very difficult. And we, the MPO board asked to study multiple locations to try to get the folks in Grand Forks behind this, yet he disregarded the, the, the political will side eliminated the, the one spot that would have helped unite the, the people in Grand Forks or on this board and said, no, we're, we're only going to 32nd Avenue South. So that's, that was part of what I was trying to get at. Yeah. You, you frequently been an outspoken critic of the MPO and, and suggested that we disregard them as yourself. Um, so I can understand from the East Grand perspective, the East Grand Forks perspective, that if Grand Forks wants to study three sites, then Grand Forks can pay for the study of three sites. They're, they're willing to pay for the study of the one that they've agreed to all along, the one that was the, the original recommendation. Um, I think that it, there's a great deal of benefit in studying all three locations, and so that's why we've got the recommendation this evening. Very good, thank you, and, sir. And I think that you deserve a lot of the credit for, for getting us to that point. Ms. Marshall. Well, this is a tough one for me because all three of these locations are in Ward 5 and people throughout the ward have very strong feelings about it, particularly in the 32nd area. Um, and, and I am not at all in favor of a 32nd Avenue bridge. I think it would be um, a poor site for a bridge. Uh, however, uh, getting more information seems to be valuable to do and doesn't commit us to anything. I think though that the fear is that it's part of a slippery slope, that you take that step and then it's all downhill from there and it just leads to one thing after another uh, to where uh, something we didn't want and didn't want from the beginning uh, turns out to be a reality. Uh, and, and so I get that and I, I, I get the emotionality of it. Um, but I also, you know, come back to there's there's value in data and value in, in at least in the first initial piece of data that uh, the city staff are asking for is to put out a request for qual qualifications. It doesn't commit us to spending any dollars on any of the the um, studies. So that. That, that feels relatively safe to me. It gives us another piece of information. But on the other hand, it has that, that feeling, I think, of 
okay, are we casting our lot even further into 32nd when we know that it's uh, the least popular site? So. Mr. Menard, one more. Just one question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> this site survey or whatever, the hydrology and hydraulics, does that come back with a pass, yes, pass with exceptions, or absolutely fail? Because if it comes back with a pass, if you make X improvements, then we're going to end up with the same kind of controversy that you talked about. Well, 47th might be better, but we still want 32nd Avenue. So is it going to be a pass-fail? Yeah. High-low bridge? What? <laughs> Mr. Grasser? <laughs> My speculation, okay, anticipation of this is that we're going to go into this study and as the consultant starts to look at things, they're going to look at, I'll just say they're going to look at the MPO cross-section and they're going to say, wow, here's something to do with that, good, bad, whatever. And we'll probably say, okay, let's try a different elevation and then let's try a high elevation. And I think what we will get out of them will be, okay, at this elevation and this location, you're going to have this kind of hydraulic impact. Here's a way of mitigating that. And, and there may be political and other, I'll just put a dollar amount. Let's just say at location X, it costs a million dollars to mitigate the hydraulic impacts to make everything balance. At site number two, it might be $3 million to mitigate that. Okay. And site number four, maybe there's very little. Maybe there's an option where we go to site number four. Maybe we don't have the full uh, height of the bridge, but it's relatively cheap. And, there, and it's, it, it's that I'm hoping, I'm not predicting, I'm hoping that that starts to get to be some of the data. And if we only study one site, you, you're not, you don't have anything to compare to. It's a million dollars to, to do site A. Okay, gee, I wonder what it might have been if we did site B or what did the million dollars go away? I don't have any of those answers. I don't have a way of giving you my anticipation of what those answers might be. Usually I, I can give you a sense of where I think, think a conclusion will come to for a, a particular task. Even if I don't articulate it, I generally have it in my mind. Uh, this one is too vague. But anyway, that's, that's what I'm hoping. That's what I think we will start to get as a, as a product out of, out of that study and where we might be able to take decision making. Mr. Ms. Ma? So at some point, I think we have to ask ourselves what the cost of doing nothing is, because it's really interesting and actually fascinating to try to piece together the history when you didn't live through it. Because I've got people telling me for 30 years, it's always been 32nd. This fight's happened repeatedly in the past, and now we're back here. It's interesting, Mr. Sandy, to hear that perspective of being on planning and zoning and thinking okay, this is just a placeholder. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people aren't familiar with planning or federal funds and what some of that takes, but certainly in order to get some of these massive projects into the queue, you do have to set a need, you have to set a priority, you have to set a location that's part of that planning process. So it's, it's interesting to piece this together, but, you know, Mr. Weber and I have been hearing from a lot of the folks that deal with the traffic and deal with the cost of doing nothing. And I think we have to, as a city, realize when was the Point Bridge put in place? How long has it been since we put a bridge further south than the Point Bridge? Been a long time. And the city's grown south, and it's grown south a lot. And now, we're still faced with this issue. And the issue's not going away. We hear about it. We hear about it from constituents who are concerned. There are traffic issues, there are safety concerns. It's not going to go away. The people sitting up here may go away because the people who are up here, a lot of whom you mentioned, aren't here anymore. And we're left to deal with this. So what I would like is to start moving forward and start getting quality data that goes to the people sitting in this chair to help the city and to focus on the city and the city's needs. And I think we're in agreement that the city needs a South End Bridge. I assure you, I can give you lists of people who will tell you that's a priority if you don't believe me. But if that's the goal and if that's the priority, let's not fight amongst ourselves. Let's put the city first and let's put the city needs first. And in that regard, 
I don't disagree. 32nd comes with a massive amount of challenges. But so does Elks Drive. And so does 47th. And when you start saying, look beyond the road, that's where even more issues come up. And we're going to have all of these issues to manage. So this could be a step towards getting some very technical data that we can look at. And we can start getting comparables. And this is a really big decision. And it comes at a very, very high dollar amount. I mean, the numbers we were looking at for bridges, $30 million, $40 million, $78 million for a high bridge. And we don't know if those are accurate. Those are really high level numbers. And I don't think that actually considers the infrastructure connecting to them. Where you talk about a 47th, maybe the 47th location is the best. And maybe we're bypassing that because we're looking at Grand Forks of city limits and we're saying, you know, that, oh, that shouldn't go there. That can't work. Maybe it could work on other aspects, but we still need to consider the road infrastructure to connect that back to the city. And that's going to come at a very high dollar amount. And we're going to have to work with our East Grand Forks partners, not only now, but into the future. Think about the wastewater interconnect project that was killed years ago because people couldn't see past themselves. And then that came up again. And we were able to work with our partners. We were able to make a decision that not only benefited East Grand Forks, but also Grand Forks. And that's, that's what we're here to do. We're here to make solutions for the city. In this case, we have to consider East Grand Forks. That's something we have to consider. But there could be, there could be a better option. 47th could be the option, and we could be looking past that. Maybe East Grand Forks is looking past that because it's outside of their city limits, but perhaps we look at the data and that is vastly better because of those mitigation costs. Maybe it's so much better for our citizens on this side that even if East Grand Forks says that does not work for us, you won't get any money from us, maybe we still look at it and say that's worth it. It's worth the extra cost because it's politically more palatable. It works better for that neighborhood. But Ms. Marshall, I think you know, I mean, there have been people who are opposed to a 47th location that have come out at different points. So to be fair, I think it's wise to go out for bid, find out what this would really cost, and then it'll come back. Perhaps it's less than we're expecting, maybe it's more. Perhaps we go back to East Grand Forks and not say as much as you pay for this site and we'll pay for this site, but we look at it proportionally and they pay 20% of the cost and we pay 80% or something, 25, 75. Maybe there's a way forward that way. I just think that our job is really to put the city and the needs first and all of the politics should come second to that. <coughs> Any other comments? Seeing none, there's a motion and a second on the floor. The motion, repeat the motion. The motion was to accept the staff report <coughs> as stated. We do a roll call vote. Weigel? Nay. Dockler? Yes. Weber? Aye. Mock? Yes. Marshall? Yes. Sandy? No. Veen? Yes. Eyes have it. Five to two. Very good. Uh, thank you for all the good discussion. And uh, I should note that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Veen. Ms. Mock and Mr. Grasser worked very hard for the city of Grand Forks on the MPO. I am a very, very significant critic of that body because I feel like um, they are exceptional on the technical side and uh, struggle a little bit on the, on the personal side, on the political side. Anyway, um, but I really appreciate and I think we all benefit greatly from the work that the three of them do on the MPO. So you represent our city very well. Any other comments for the good of the order? Is there a motion to adjourn? Oh.
Um, Mr. Phelan? Council President Sandy, other, other business, Leroy has, a, has an item for your review. Other business? Yeah. Great. She'll, she'll name off the agenda item for you for review. Thank you. Hi, Leroy. Thank you. Good evening, President Sandy, uh, members we, of the committee. We should have I taken appreciate, this earlier. Sorry yeah, about that. That's okay. I appreciate that uh, you, you're uh, willing to listen to this one uh, this evening. Um, this is in regards to consideration of bids, construction service consulting agreement, um, and this was this item was actually approved. Uh, these bids were approved last Monday, as you recall, um, and this is for project number eight zero three zero. And um, in what I've provided is an updated staff report to you, um, and so. This is in, is in regards to the landfill scale and ba building rehabilitation project. Uh, the staff report for the city council meeting September 16th was updated to reflect approval of schedule B. Um, and per city attorney recommendation with no uh, legal bid abnormalities. Uh, however, city staff and consultants had noted a 70% low deviation um, on schedule B electrical bid. And upon review with the bidder this past week, uh, the bidder has requested to withdraw their bid. Um, and so I've attached the email correspondence in that regard. Um, and city staff at this time, based on the information we have, um, recommends considering uh, to accept this, re this withdrawal in the best interest of the city upon re final review and approval by the city attorney uh, to include, but not limited to, the reference of the attached language from the project's bid specifications. And with the bid opening having occurred on September 5th, uh, staff further requests to provide a notice of award to ICS with a notice to proceed at a later date and pending final approval by City, City Council next week, or on October 7th, I guess, in two weeks. And so I've attached uh, the Schedule A bid summary and the A and B combo and then also the email uh, correspondence and the instructions to bidders and the prior staff report for your reference. Uh, I apologize for uh, the late information on this. And so I want to be able to summarize a little bit what's occurred here. Um, we conferred with uh, Howard Swanson City Attorney on this prior to last week. Uh, and what we noted on and he advised that we shouldn't interpret the bid. Uh, we noticed that there was a 70% deviation, and we were concerned about that amount um, and felt that there were things that were left out. Uh, so while we don't want to be play interpreter on any of these bids, um, what we noted was the bid for the automated items and security items was the fixed amount that the city and the consultant had provided to them in order to tie into the city's existing system. And then they were and understood that they were to build from there on their bid for those particular items, for those components and in installation. Uh, additionally, they didn't provide a vendor name that was required as part of the bid. Uh, again, not a legal requirement. Howard recommended that the fact that they had put in a bid amount was enough to hold them to that bid. Um, so the question is, uh, you know, the question is whether it's advantageous to the city to proceed with an electrical bid for which they would like to withdraw. And the other option would be, if I understand it, Howard, is to, that we would have remedy through their bid bond um, if they decided not to sign the agreement. And then we would go um, toward the bid bond and then we would have to in turn do a change order for those components to get back to where we want to be with this project. So this is the dilemma we're in. Um, and so while you have no legal obligation to consider that, um, I believe that based on the amount that was filled in that we could reasonably interpret that they weren't including all of the components. The amount difference indicates that they weren't including all the components, and that's of concern to us as staff to get this project completed. Um, and so I wanted to bring this back to you for your consideration and discussion. So with that, um, I welcome any questions or if Howard would like to offer some answer. Well, I will give you very briefly my position. I won't make a determination here. This is a policy decision. The law is very clear that when a vendor submits a bid and it is accepted and awarded, 
that bidder is bound by the bid that they proposed. The time to withdraw the bid would have been prior to the action the city council takes. What I've advised the department is that legally that bidder is now stuck with that bid. If they refuse to proceed forward under that bid, our opportunity is to then proceed against the bid bond. And what you would be seeking would be the difference in the cost from what the bid was to your second lowest bidder. In this case, I think it was approximately $70,000. It is a policy decision as to whether you wish to waive the timeliness of this request to withdraw a bid and to allow the bid to withdraw and then to award the bid to what would be the second lowest bidder. The reason you cannot interpret the bid is this was a lump sum bid award. Even though they asked for individual line items, you can have a contractor that will place their markup, their profit, or whatever it might be in certain line items so that you don't always see the difference. You, in, in the case of the staff, they're looking at a number and they're assuming that all things are equal or even among all the bidders and therefore this one is low, but you don't know why it's low. And that's why I told them, unless that information appears within the face of the document, the bid form, you cannot guess, you cannot speculate, you cannot interpret why there's a difference in that one line item. You look to the lump sum. Having said all of that, I'm not recommending that you not allow the vendor to withdraw their bid. All I'm telling you is legally you can hold them to that bid. If you choose for other purposes to exercise your discretion in allowing them to withdraw the bid and then to award to the next bidder, that's, you have that ability to do that, but under no means are you obligated to do so. And it is not a city attorney's decision to make, it is a council decision to make. Mr. Veen, comments? Mr. Yeah, Mr. Swanson, do you remember of this type of issue happening in the past? Oh, yes. That we've, that we've actually, um, after it's been awarded? That's the unusual nature here. Uh, I, I can identify situations in which a request has come forward before the award has been made, in which the city has allowed bids to be withdrawn. I can identify situations where a request to withdraw a bid before the award has been given has come in and the city has said, no, we will not allow you to withdraw the bid. I have not been able to identify a situation. I can't tell you with all certainty it's never happened, but I don't have a situation where this has occurred after the fact. Now, I'm not telling you there wouldn't potentially be a fight here, uh, either with the bonding company or with the vendor or somewhere down the road. That's some of the issues that you're going to have to weigh as a council in reaching a decision. But uh, uh, surprisingly, the vendor, even though the bids were opened in public, there was a bid tabulation available before last council's meeting. We heard nothing from the vendor before that point. It's only after that point. Uh, and, and I understand what staff was concerned with in, in following up. That work um, really should have been on the hands of the vendor to be doing that type of response. Mr. Swanson, do you see this having implications for the city on the integrity of our bidding process? I've been around a long time. I can tell you that a number of years ago, the city council was very hardline and that they would not allow withdrawal of a bid once it was submitted for any purpose. And the reason that that was stated was because of that concern. I have not really seen a degradation of our bids where we have allowed withdrawal. And it's been very rare that that's the issue has come up and it's been rare that we've allowed it. But that certainly is a concern. That's one of the theories behind the law that holds a vendor to their bid. In reality or practicality, I can't tell you that I've really observed that condition. I, I also would assume you have a contractor who's in a losing situation, doesn't 
usually go with a very smooth process. Um, change orders, all of that typically could come back as they try to recover their losses, impacting time and all of the coordination between the other prime contractors is a little bit concerning. Absolutely. I think you can anticipate a disgruntled vendor uh, trying to find any opportunity to identify change circumstances, change conditions, additional time, whatever it might be. And, and yeah, it, it doesn't lend itself to the smoothest of operations. Mr. Weigel. I'll make a motion to accept staff recommendation, allow them to withdraw the, the bid. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second, second, but I'm I would be curious about your opinion, President Sandy. This is one of those uh, no-win situations, right? Uh, local business trying to do the best they can. They got caught with their pants down, and here we are. So uh, I think I would agree with Mr. Weigel. Let's move on, and we'll take it by a case-by-case -case basis like we always do. I don't know. I haven't read the material that that's come to the department. I don't know if they've offered an explanation as to, you know, why their bid is is uh, not in accordance with uh, expectations. I don't know if that's important to you or not. But uh, um, you do have the legal authority to uh, approve the motion as as stated. Sorry, Ms. Mock. So, why wouldn't this get handled through a change order that would come? Late, or is that not an option to proceed and then they come with a change order that either gets approved or not approved for what they missed? What would be the change? In order to do a change order, you have to have some, in effect, change either in right, the scope like, of work or whatever. Just a, in general, I like think if that we the reason this, you don't do that is then you encourage <coughs> low bids with the expectation that somewhere down the road, then I'll recover that with a change order. So. Okay, which is a, and we don't want to do that. So if we, I guess I'm concerned about letting them withdraw after the fact that we then face that issue in the future that if somebody, I mean, part of the responsibility for bidding is to make sure that you include all the components. They actually certify and bid that they have read the bid specifications and the bid submitted complies with all the bid specs. But a change order with this vendor is not an option. I would okay. advise you not to go that direction. Right. I think you have one or two practical choices. One is you hold this vendor to the bid they've submitted. Number two, you allow them to withdraw the bid and they are no longer a consideration as a vendor on this project and you go to your next lowest vendor. I think those are very two And we options. have a next lowest to go to yes. for this project. Yes. Okay. Mr. Weigel? Uh, Mr. Swanson, if this were to happen again by this local business, um, do we have the opportunity not to accept bids from them anymore? No. <coughs> you may have the opportunity to determine whether they're the most responsible and responsive bidder, but you could not blackball or blacklist them, so they could not submit bids. But if we don't feel like they're the most responsible bid at that time, we could go with another one. If they are the lowest bidder, the law in North Dakota is a very high presumption that you award that bid to the lowest bidder unless you can articulate uh, a pretty substantial reason as to why they are either not responsive to the bid request or a responsible bidder. So the burden is, is pretty high to meet that, but that is a possibility. Thank you. Mr. Bean. Yeah, Mr. Bean. Yes, sir. Uh, what is our experience working with this vendor on previous projects? Uh, we've worked with this vendor, to my knowledge, on uh, on some electrical projects, and uh, with my experience, has been on the fiber optic project. And and how were they to work with? What's the working relationship? Uh... From my understanding, it's been positive, and I'll uh, have Dale answer more. Good evening. Dale Burgum from Webster Foster and Weston Consulting Engineers in town here. Uh, we worked with this, with this vendor on lift station 17 rehab that was completed probably about a year ago. Um, really good to get along with on that project. Thank you. 
Any other comments, Mr. Weber? Yes, in follow-up to that, Ms. Amundsen, you, I heard you apologize a little bit ago. I, I don't think that you have anything to apologize for. Uh, reading through the correspondence, it seems that you've acted with, with great integrity. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Well, we, you know, we, it's about timing, too, and so we would have hoped to have had this uh, earlier, uh, prior to last week's meeting. So I'll take some responsibility for that and, you know, making sure that we follow up, obviously. Um, and we did, but it, it's just an unfortunate They actually pulled the bid at 3.30 this situation. afternoon. Yeah. So, so it, I don't see, again, how you have to apologize for anything. So, and, and just as a, just to follow up, um, so we're requesting to uh, rescind the bid rescind the award of bid and accept withdrawal of Schedule B electrical bid from Fusion Automation, uh, approve construction bids and award the, award the lump sum bid Schedule A, uh, including unit price adjustment and alternate to ICS in the amount of $3,558,600. And the rest of the motion uh, stays as stated um, from the previous meeting. Mr. Dean? Well, I, th I think this motion would probably make two people very happy. It'll make the low bidder very happy because he's not going to lose money, and the second low is going to be very happy because now they have a project. Um, so, uh, and I do think the 70,000 or so difference is probably not going to ultimately be 70,000 because of what, how you react when you're working with somebody who's not, and the impacts to the project and time delays is probably there too. So, it you know, I guess I'm seeing the recommendation. And Council Member this. Veen, if I can clarify, just to make sure, um, because we're moving from Schedule A or Schedule B to Schedule A, the difference is ninety-four thousand five hundred seven dollars. Everybody in concurrence. Any other comments or thoughts? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yes, Mr. Weber. Thank you. Could quickly a question for Mr. Feeland. Uh, in response to uh, the, the flooding, yes, the, um, I've heard various rumors. Can you clarify the, the city's response to uh, to the flooding this weekend? Sure, uh, Council President Sanning, Council Member Weber, and all council members. Um, uh, many of our crews had has a, had a busy weekend, so if I could just kind of give you a, a general overview. Uh, number one, thanks to our public safety crews, uh, public works crews, and and our to our waterworks crews and. Um, so I think that was an enormous amount of rain that we got over a short amount of time. And I think the initial response, obviously it inundated the streets, it inundated, inundated our storm sewer systems, and in turn it inundated our wastewater systems. And so um, I think in certain areas, um, we, have, we, we struggle with um, uh, inflow and infiltration issues. And those are primarily in our older parts of the city. And so I'll give you some numbers on, on wastewater stations. And obviously, a lot of this has to be uh, inflow. And so um, there's a sanitary sewer station five, which is up here by the uh, Lumber Exchange apartment building, formerly the, the Simonson's uh, Lumber Yard. Um, on an average day, that should be about 600,000 gallons a day. And, and we were running over the weekend 1.5 million gallons per day and 4.5 million gallons per day. So that, that's significant. Station uh, number eight, which is um, off of Belmont, the Maryland Hagerty Station, down by 15th Avenue South. Uh, on a typical day, that's 120,000 gallons per day, and we were at a million and 1.5 MGD and 2.3 MGD. So our wastewater systems were inundated, and then I think in turn, um, from probably from rainwater seeping into people's basements, also the the, the amount of um, wastewater that we had going through our systems, we had some challenges regarding that. And in turn, you know, um, Public Works is picking up um, a lot of material in certain neighborhoods that we struggle with on the stormwater systems. And these, um, the stormwater systems that are, are pretty well known, and we've made some incremental improvements, but there are some really significant improve, um, improvements that we do need to make, but they're awfully expensive. And um, you probably weren't here as a city council member, but it's kind of a highlighted area. It's in and around where the hospital is on, on the, uh, on the east side so if you took Demers Avenue I'm going to say down to 32nd Washington to to Columbia that's an area that we struggle it's an internal to the city it has pump stations but a lot of the lines are un underserved and there's certain neighborhoods within there that are lower than others and so when we have a significant rain they they're more impacted so there are pockets in the city where um, there was more damage in people's basements um, as we move forward so I will only say that you have a um, I'll, I'll mention a couple of wastewater um, operators 
at the risk of not highlighting everyone, but there's a there's a gentleman named uh, Pete Amalt. He's the wastewater supervisor, collection supervisor. There's a uh, gentleman named Chris Grant, who's a wastewater lead operator, and these gentlemen were working all weekend along with their colleagues. But you know, you should just know kind of the kind of people that you have that are keeping things going, and uh, the kind of crews that really take things personal and uh, almost um, take it to heart to blame because they, they're hearing from neighbors, they're trying to get the systems going, and there's only so much they can do with, with the infrastructure itself. So I think there's going to be some areas that we need to evaluate from an infrastructure perspective as we move forward um, and, and what we can do, and perhaps we have to look at cost shares and, and, and evaluating some areas around town and uh, as we move forward. And I should mention the final piece, our, our residents of Grand Forks, you know, certainly we're there to help and assist, but there's some people that have had losses and so our heart goes out to them and I think you should know our crews are out there doing the very best they can and it, to some degree it overwhelmed our infrastructure and our crews did everything we could to make sure that the issue wasn't greater than than it was. Mr. Bean? <clears throat> I don't know I've heard this could be anywhere from a 50 to 100 year storm event so it was, it's very unusual to have that much and of course in that short period of time. Um, was the wastewater treatment plant able to keep up with those additional flows that you just described besides the pump stations trying to pump it? Um, I think the answer is no. Um, it was for a while. So what we do is um, um, the, ele uh, the elevation of our wastewater treatment plant is higher, is higher than the city. So we have to pump it to the wastewater treatment plant. And so what we do is that we can um, offset some of the flow going to the plant itself and we can divert it to the to the lagoons, which mm -hmm. reduces some of the, the pressure that's going to our wastewater treatment plant. So we do that in most rainstorms, that's what we do. And all the pump stations remain working um, well because we relieve a lot of the pressure by just diverting some of the flow to the, to the lagoons and it doesn't have to go all through the plant. So we did that to start. And there were a couple um, pump stations, the ones, ones that I just mentioned, that we did have to uh, divert to the river, a portion of that flow, and so um, we will have to we will have to submit to the Department of Health uh, that we violated and went to the river. Um, of course, most of it was um, rainwater um, infiltration. So, but we do have to report that because that is a violation. <coughs> We're supposed to keep the wastewater in the wastewater system, and we did have to go to the river um, to make sure that we didn't have um, greater infrastructure loss with private property. And so we did do that. I think um, as of last night, last evening, I should say, all systems were back back to normal um, after um, we were able to catch up in our wastewater systems. Well, one other question. Um, I know you talked about that area east, well, actually east of all true. Yeah. Um, a year ago or so, we did reroute or increase the size of the line from Columbia Road around all true into the Cooley with the idea of knowing that when we go further east between Columbia Road and 20th, that that would probably need to be increased in, in size and capacity. So that's one thing we may want to consider or even move up so that we can get that done. That would certainly improve the drainage in the area that you just described. Yeah. And a lot of times what you have is you have a larger pipe that's going into a smaller pipe. Everything starts backing up. Um, and, and provides pressure. And so we have some situations where we might have some larger pipes as, as Mr. Vian explained, but it's there's down the, down the road or down the way of those pipes are smaller pipes that are older. And so, uh, and it's hard to um, dig up all the pipes throughout the whole city and, and replace all those. So we, we, we do some incremental, we've done incremental things as Mr. Vian has explained. We haven't done revolutionary kinds of things in these, in these same areas. And I'm sure there's continued frustration in those areas uh, tonight. And you know, it's awful. Um, we can only imagine what they went through over the weekend. And uh, we'll go through, I, I suspect, this week, so. Mr. Phelan, um, this might be a question from Mr. Grasser, actually. Um, when you have holding ponds in areas of town and you have multiple very large pipes going in with a smaller pipe going out, were we seeing any of the holding ponds going over the tops? President Sandy, thankfully, no. Uh, I observed probably eight or ten of them, and I didn't. Uh, they were all uh, well contained in, in on the pond, the ponds themselves. They were high water, but they were contained. The uh, south end drainway is probably the most water I've seen in that. Uh, 
in the recent past. It's interesting. So uh, probably most of you don't know, Robin Hall ended up with six feet or six inches of water on, in the basement that came down, came across the road and down because the water went so high, it went down the driveway down and uh, it's got significant drains and f I think four massive sump pumps that the, when the water came down, it essentially broke the garage door and, and filled the basement and, and the pumps just simply couldn't keep up with it. But I don't understand how the water could get that high on the road there when there's a, a in theory, a collecting pond just right across the road on the other side. I'm not familiar Poor with that. Poor infrastructure. That exact situation. University, yeah. right? Yes, right. Well, that's, the, 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 to get the water from point A to point B, you've got to have enough inlet capacity, enough pipe capacity, and enough, and I think most likely what happened in there is there just wasn't enough pipe capacity. Sure. Again, we design, and the university, I think, generally designs for about a five-year storm event. This was close to a 100-year event. Sure. Um, so wow. it, it's just greatly exceeded all the design standards, and, and that's when bad stuff happens. Any other comments? Thank you, Mr. Chris. Yep. Ms. Dockler? Um, no questions for you, just a couple statements. If there's anybody that's still hanging in there watching tonight, um, I just wanted to remind people that the landfill has extended hours from 8 to 7 p.m. through Friday for drop-off. Um, and that landfill drop-off of water damaged items, there isn't that extra charge or an extra charge for pickup during the regular garbage days for those items. Um, and that also that the Salvation Army has free flood cleaning kits that they're giving out to individuals that need them. Um, and I also want to thank the Emergency Management Office for working diligently to um, collaboratively work with all of our Upper Red River Valley community organizations that are active in disaster relief. They have been working around the clock, just as it's been um, cited tonight, to try and help people who are feeling overwhelmed. So I am extremely appreciative. Mr. Bean? Okay, and one uh, announcement on my behalf. Uh, tomorrow night at 6 o'clock, I have a ward meeting, Ward 7 meeting at the Alara Center, uh, again at 6 p.m., and welcome all those to uh, attend. Anything else for the Mr. Weigel? We'll be adjourned. We move to adjourn. Second by Veen. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We're adjourned. Good meeting. Thank you for being with us tonight. This meeting has been brought to you in part by... Let Grand Forks International Airport help you start your next vacation off on the right foot. Grand Forks International Airport offers flights to the sunny destinations of Orlando, Las Vegas, and Phoenix on Allegiant, and connections anywhere in the world through Minneapolis-St. Paul on Delta. Forget the hassle of long drives, parking nightmares, and stressful check-ins. The convenience of flying locally means less headaches and more time for you. Grand Forks International Airport. Your airport. Simply grand. Know what's in this box? Well, in case your crystal ball is broken, here's a hint. Safe, reliable energy, for starters, but there's also a commitment to this community. See, at Excel Energy, this is our hometown. So we're not just about making a living here, we're about living here. Oh, I wish I had wings. In our community, we're always delivering. Excel Energy, responsible by nature. Chris Young, live, Raised on Country Tour. I was raised on country. October 3rd, Alaris Center. Chris Young, hit after amazing hit. And tonight I'm drowning. With special guests, Eli Youngman and Matt Stell.
Tickets on sale now at LiveNation.com or Ticketmaster.com. Chris Young, Raised on Country Tour. Ooh.